Welcome to the Huberman Lab podcast, where we discuss science and science-based tools for everyday life. I'm Andrew Huberman, and I'm a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford School of Medicine. Today, my guest is Dr. Susanna Soberg. Dr. Susanna Soberg completed her doctoral thesis work at the Center of Inflammation and Metabolism and the Center for Physical Activity Research at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Her research has focused on how deliberate cold exposure and deliberate heat exposure can be used to enhance human metabolism. She is the first author of a seminal study which discovered the minimum thresholds for deliberate heat and deliberate cold exposure for increasing brown fat thermogenesis, which is essentially a mode of increasing heat production and metabolism in the body, and for establishing actionable protocols that can be used outside of the laboratory to improve metabolism and human health. Dr. Sober's research was published in the journal Cell Reports Metabolism in 2021, adding to a long and important history of research focusing on the role of cold and the role of heat in altering various aspects of the body's physiology, including hormone health, metabolism, and changes in neurotransmitters such as dopamine and epinephrine. In fact, today's discussion with Dr. Soberg focuses on the role of deliberate heat and deliberate cold exposure on metabolism, but it also includes discussion of the effects of cold and heat on things like neurotransmitter production, namely dopamine and epinephrine and norepinephrine, the so-called catecholamines, which strongly impact mood and metabolism. In addition, Dr. Soberg answers many common questions about deliberate cold and deliberate heat exposure, including, for instance, the difference between cold showers versus cold immersion up to the neck versus total body cold immersion, including whether or not going back and forth between heat and cold changes fundamentally the way that heat and cold impact the metabolism, hormones, and neurotransmitter production. And we talk about almost every single nuance and variation on deliberate cold and deliberate heat exposure protocols as it relates to the underlying science. In particular, how cold receptors at the level of the skin are impacted versus cold reception and perception at the level of the brain, and how all of that impacts systems of the brain and body relating to mental health, physical health, and performance. Based on her scientific research and academic training, as well as her understanding and use of deliberate heat and deliberate cold exposure protocols, Dr. Soberg is considered one of the world's leading experts on these topics. In fact, she is the author of a recent book entitled Winter Swimming, which is, I have to say, a terrific book because it breaks down chapter by chapter the different aspects of deliberate heat and deliberate cold into its various constituent parts, including cold acclimatization, the cold shock response, dangers and safeties of cold water, the impact of cold and the impact of heat on various aspects of human health, as well as specifics relating to sauna versus ice versus cold swimming, showers, etc. It's a very thorough read and a very easy and accessible read that if you are interested in deliberate cold or deliberate heat exposure or both, will allow you to embrace those protocols with the greatest degree of confidence that you're going to obtain the specific endpoints that you're interested in and to do so safely. Before we begin, I'd like to emphasize that this podcast is separate from my teaching and research roles at Stanford. It is, however, part of my desire and effort to bring zero cost to consumer information about science and science-related tools to the general public. In keeping with that theme, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's podcast. Our first sponsor is Plunge. Plunge makes what I believe is the most versatile at-home self-cooling cold plunge for deliberate cold exposure. I've talked numerous times on this podcast about the many benefits of deliberate cold exposure. And indeed, today's episode is focused entirely on the benefits and the science of deliberate cold exposure. Plunge uses a powerful cooling filtration and sanitation unit to give you access to deliberate cold exposure in clean water whenever you want. As we will discuss during today's episode with Dr. Susanna Soberg, deliberate cold exposure, especially deliberate cold exposure done up to the neck in water, can be used to achieve a number of important endpoints related to mental health, physical health, and performance. I've been using a plunge for more than two years now. I can tell you that it makes it very easy to get your deliberate cold exposure at home. It doesn't require much cleaning. In fact, it's very easy to keep clean, which is essential. You don't want bacteria and other things growing in your cold plunge. Basically, everything about the plunge is made easy so that anyone, including myself, can get their deliberate cold exposure on a regular basis at home. If you're interested in getting a plunge, you can go to plunge, spelled P-L-U-N-G-E dot com slash Huberman and get $150 off your cold plunge. Again, that's plunge.com slash Huberman for $150 off. 
Today's episode is also brought to us by Maui Nui Venison, which I can confidently say is the most nutrient-dense and delicious red meat available. Maui Nui spent nearly a decade building a USDA-certified wild harvesting system to help balance deer populations on the island of Maui. The solution they built turns the proliferation of an invasive species into a wide range of nutrient-dense products, from butcher cuts and organ meats to bone broth and jerky. Their bone broth has an unmatched 25 grams of protein per 100 calories. Several guests on this podcast who are experts in nutrition have pointed to the value of getting at least one gram of quality protein per pound of body weight each day. With Maui Nui, that's very easy to do while eating delicious meals and getting it from a sustainable source. If you would like to try Maui Nui venison, go to Maui com slash Huberman and get 20% off your first order. Again, that's com slash Huberman to get 20% off. Today's episode is also brought to us by Thesis. Thesis makes custom nootropics and nootropics is not a word that I like because it means smart drugs and the brain doesn't have neural circuits for being smart, rather it has neural circuits for focus, neural circuits for task switching, neural circuits for creativity and on and on. Thesis understands this and designs custom nootropics designed to get your brain and body into a specific state in order to do the mental and or physical work that's important to you, such as creativity or focus or clarity. If you'd like to try Thesis nootropics, you simply go to their website, you fill out a brief quiz, and they will design a custom starter pack so that you can assess which things work for you more or less well. And then they'll iterate with you over the course of the next few weeks or months to come up with the ideal nootropic kit for your needs. To get your own personalized nootropic starter kit, go online to takethesis.com slash Huberman. You can take that three-minute quiz, and they'll send you four different formulas to try in your first month. Again, that's takethesis.com slash Huberman, and use the code Huberman at checkout to get 10% off your first box. I'm pleased to announce that I will be hosting two live events in September of 2023. The first live event will take place in Toronto on September 12th. The second live event will take place in Chicago on September 28th. Both live events will include a lecture and a question and answer period and are entitled The Brain Body Contract, during which I will discuss tools and science related to mental health, physical health, and performance. And I should mention that a lot of that content will have absolutely no overlap with content covered previously on the Huberman Lab podcast or elsewhere. If you're interested in attending either or both of these events, please go to hubermanlab.com slash tour and enter the code Huberman to get early access to tickets. Once again, that's hubermanlab.com slash tour and use the code Huberman to access tickets. I hope to see you there. And now for my discussion with Dr. Susanna Soberg. Dr. Susanna Soberg, welcome. Thank you. So great to have you here. I feel like I should give a little bit of the backstory of how we got connected, which was that for many years, I've been interested in cold thermogenesis. It was the topic of my senior thesis in college. And I've, of course, followed the uh, popularity of Wim Hof. And we've had Dr. Craig Heller, my colleague from biology department at Stanford, who works on cold and its impact on physiology and sports performance. So for a long time, I've been interested in this area, but there's been a real uh, lack of new, let's say, high profile quality scientific information in terms of how, for instance, cold plunges, and sauna, how that impacts human physiology. I know there's been some information out there, but it's been sort of scattered. And then a little over a year ago, I see this paper in Cell Reports Medicine and was immediately struck. Uh, the First of all, the fact that it was in Cell Reports Medicine. I've been on the Cell Press ed editorial board for a long time now. So press journals are, of course, phenomenal journals. Mm -hmm. And the title and the content of the paper was directly in line with the sorts of practices that people are very curious about and then are starting to emerge, things like sauna, cold plunges. And there was your name first on the author list. And I reached out to you through social media and we've done a little bit of live content there together. And I've been tracking what you've been doing in the world in terms of your book and talking about the results in your manuscript and talking about the science and impact of deliberate cold exposure and sauna. And I have to say that it's been a wonderful and remarkable thing to see. And you're bringing so much quality information about this area that for a long time, I think was kind of niche and is now becoming more and more mainstream. So I'm going to start off with a thank you for being here and a thank you for the work that you've done. And I'm looking forward to talking to you about it today. So my first question um, to get things started is what is happening when we get into an uncomfortably cold environment. So for instance, if I'm 
really hot on a hot day, jumping into a cold pool feels really good. But if I'm already kind of uh, at room temperature, I'm a little bit chilly, getting into that same temperature of water doesn't feel so good, right? There's mm. a shock there. Mm. So if you could just walk us through what happens when we get into uncomfortably cold water, whether or not it's by way of shower or cold plunge, at the level of our physiology, and if you'd like our psychology, I think that's a good place for us to start because I think it will orient people to their own experience if they do that. Yeah. And for those that haven't done it, um, might start to peel back some of the, the layers as to what the underlying mechanisms of cold are. Yeah. Thank you for that question. It's really good to just address what actually happens in our physiology when we get cold. And you can get cold in many ways. So you can just head out for the one that gives you the most potent stressor, which is submerging into cold water. And But you could also go in outside in the cold wind. That's also going to activate your, um, your sympathetic nervous system. So get all these neurotransmitters going in your body and so your your catecholamines. Um, let's just address that we are taking a cold plunge, for example. So if you are very hot, for example, um, before you go into the cold water, it's going to feel less, it's going to feel less stressful, but the, the temperature uh, difference from your skin to the cold is definitely going to give you a, a shock, but your core temperature is warmer and that's going to feel a little bit better. So that's why when people go into a sauna, for example, and go out and in into the cold water, they 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 can do it easily, uh, easier than if they were cold beforehand. Mm -hmm. Could so, I just um, ask you a few questions? So you you mentioned the sympathetic nervous system, which for um, people listening who aren't familiar with that is the the branch of our nervous system that's responsible for creating accelerations in heart rate, um, feelings of alertness. It's accompanied with stress and the stress response, but it's accompanied with uh, waking up in the morning for that matter. So it's not always about stress. And then you mentioned the catecholamines, which um, are dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. So maybe a little bit later, we'll talk about those individual neurotransmitters. But you raise a really important point, which is something I get asked about a lot for people that are curious about using deliberate cold exposure, which is how cold should the water be? And I know it's very hard to give a straight prescription for that, because I think it boils down to what you just said, which is it's really the difference between your current temperature and really the temperature at the surface of your skin and the temperature of the water. So if you're very warm, getting into cold feels good. If you're already cold, getting into more cold feels stressful. Um, is there any way that we can start to gauge what is the best way to approach a deliberate cold exposure protocol? I mean, should it feel uncomfortable? And that leads into the question of how do we balance the discomfort with the amount of time that we spend in? So for instance, if it's just a little bit uncomfortable, will spending more time in the cold get us the same benefit as getting into very uncomfortably cold water for a very short period of time? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I definitely think that this could be um, future studies on this as well to really unravel uh, what kind of protocols uh, are, the, are the best way or also for which outcomes, of course. So... If the temperature is uh, very cold and you feel that and you also feel very cold, then you, you should stay in the water a little bit longer. So I think it's just you should get uncomfortable cold. So as long as you get uncomfortable cold, it's cold enough and you get this what we call the cold shock. So the cold shock is activation of your sympathetic nervous system and these uh, activation of the, the catecholamines, which you just mentioned before. Does the shock mean that I'm having trouble controlling my breathing? Is that a good gauge? Uh yeah, you can say so because that's kind of like how we define it. So you hyperventilate, so you have a faster um, uh, breathing rate. Um, so that increases also because you activate your gasping reflex if you are new to this. Um, but if you are adapted, it, it kind of subsides with time, uh, with ad adaptation. So what you can do is that you can train this cold exposure and you can kind of like get adapted to it. So you don't have this hyperventilating response every time you go out in the cold water. So this is like building up your resilience, building, building up your adaptation is going to make this shock like subside a bit. So it's it's always harder in the beginning, but you should do hard things, right? It's not something that we... You shouldn't think about cold water and cold water immersion as something that is comfortable. It should be hard because that's the point of it, right? If you enjoy it, then yeah, then I'm I'm thinking something is wrong. It's not right. You should not enjoy it. Well, this is an important point that you're making because I think that many people shy away from deliberate cold exposure 
because it's uncomfortable in a way that at least from my experience is very different than the discomfort of exercise. Because with exercise, for instance, um, if running hard, you know, running fast and breathing hard is uncomfortable, you can slow down or walk. If, um, you know, lifting weights is uncomfortable, you can remove some weight or reduce the number of repetitions or stop. With deliberate cold exposure, I suppose you can be sort of halfway in, halfway out of the water or partially underneath the cold shower, but it's very hard to titrate mm. uh, and adjust the level. To, it's kind of all or none. And I've seen, um, actually just, I can tell this by anecdote, I, I've done some work with military special operations. Um, I won't say which country, this was outside the US. Um, and these are very tough individuals. They're used to going without sleep and doing hard, high consequence, high risk kind of work. And they were asked to do some cold water exposure training and I was there that day and it was remarkable. About a third of them just went straight in and mm -hmm. just kind of grinded through it. You know, like they looked stoic anyway, to me. Um, <laughs> there were a few whimpers, no cries. About a third um, talked a lot and got really, you could tell that they were agitated and anxious, but yeah. they made it through. And then about a third of them just simply would not get in past their knees or thighs. Were just, it seemed like they were just dreading the whole experience. Some actually didn't actually go in completely, um, which was really surprising to me. And I, you couldn't tell based on their physical appearance or anything else about them. They're all high performers as to who would have this response. So it seems like people vary tremendously in terms of their ability to embrace the discomfort of the cold. Is that from your studies, is that your experience as well? Or, or are there these weird mutants who seem to just love going into the cold for the first time? So some people just feel better in the cold and some people uh, dread the cold even more. And you can say the more people are pushing the cold away, they might feel the cold pain even more. So they, they, they would definitely, people who are maybe the soldiers you, you just talked about, they, some of them might be already adapted to the cold. So if they are not scared of the cold, they go out and they embrace the cold in a better way. It could also be that some people have a more sensitive nervous system. And when you are a bit sensitive to the cold, you will, of course, try to get a away from it, right? And you will also have the cold pain more, um, feel the cold pain more if, if, if you avoid it. So the more you avoid the cold, the, the more pain, painful it will feel uh, when you go into it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. You mentioned being outside in a t-shirt versus um, cold immersion up to the neck versus shower. I think... Um, this is something a lot of people wonder about. What are the differences in terms of impact, short-term and perhaps even long-term, between cold showers, cold plunge to the neck, so that could be in ice water or just very cold water, um, immersion with dunking one's head and then coming up, because obviously people have to come up for air at some point, <laughs> and then simply being outside on a cold day in shorts and a t-shirt or something of that sort. So there are different outcomes um, because they're, they are very different uh, exposures of the cold to your cold receptors in your skin. So the more you can say you cover your body in the cold, which you would do in cold water because they're, of course, covered totally and, and, and the molecules are uh, closer to your skin, you will have a more potent um, activation of all your cold uh, receptors in the skin. So that one will definitely activate your autonomous nervous system more and mm -hmm. rapid uh, compared to going out in a t-shirt in the cold wind, just go for a walk. Um, but that is also something that's going to activate your uh, sympathetic nervous system, mm -hmm. meaning then that you will have an increase in norepinephrine uh, and you will activate something called uh, the, the brown fat. So this is a healthy kind of uh, fat tissue that we have in our body. And when you activate that, that's going to um, increase your metabolism. Before we talk about brown fat, and mm -hmm. I'm so glad you brought it up mm -hmm. um, because it's so much to talk about there. Uh, what about cold shower? I mean, obviously cold shower is somewhere in between yeah. um, being out outside in the air, cold air, versus uh, being immersed up to the neck? If we had more studies on, on cold showers, we would learn more about how does that activate our metabolism? How does that increase our uh, neurotransmitters in the brain, which could also have an impact our, on our mental uh, balance? So I think that would be interesting for the future. Um, but what we do know is from, from, uh, from 
activating brown fat. And uh, both from rodent uh, studies, but also in, in humans, is that as soon as we get cold on our skin, we will activate our brown fat. So it is kind of like our first responder in, in the body to keep uh, our um, temperature up. So our muscles is like the second tissue in our body. We have two tissues which can increase our uh, thermogenesis. So the brown fat, which is like always like temperature regulating our body. And then we have uh, the, the muscles, which will secondarily uh, start to shiver. And that's going to increase our um, temperature in the body. But as soon as you go into a cold shower, you will activate your brown fat uh, also immediately. So it could be good also for increasing metabolism in theory, because we haven't really any studies showing how much does it actually activate the brown fat. So if someone out there wants to do a study, on that, I think be great. Uh, I've thought about why there are fewer studies of cold showers than cold immersion. And I think the answer to my mind is that from a methodological standpoint, it's just harder to do because if people are getting into cold water up to the neck, they're getting into cold water up to the neck. Whereas if people are getting into a cold shower, some people are larger or smaller. Some people are going to stand under the shower with it hitting their head. Some people, the back of the neck, you could direct people to do it, Yeah. but it's a little bit um, more difficult. Also, I think uh, for you and I are both research scientists, there's a little bit of a um, methodological challenge that might seem silly to people, but it's a real one, which is if people are in a cold shower, also the water is going to be I'm kind of pushing their clothing against their skin. There's a certain vulnerability in, uh, for most people um, coming to a laboratory in the first place, let alone being observed while they shower. Yeah. Whereas when you get into cold, immer in cold immersion, you're, you're getting under the water. And uh, you know, some people might roll their eyes and say, okay, really, is that the barrier? But you know, science exists in these real world contexts. And this will vary by culture and things of that sort. But we run human subjects in my lab. And I'll tell you just um, the process of getting people to the laboratory and having them park and find the lab and you know, it's a whole new environment with people in lab coats and people moving around and where's the restroom. I mean, it's a, there's, a, there's a certain amount of stress just associated with taking part in a study for most human subjects. So um, I uh, totally agree. However, we need more studies of, of cold showers. It's just a harder environment to control yeah. in, in, my, in my mind. So it sounds like any form of cold to the skin that people register as what you call the cold shock or uncomfortable, like, oh, like this is kind of um, jarring, activates the brown fat. Do we know what the pathway is from cold receptors on the skin to the brown fat? I mean, how does the brown fat know that we're cold? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really good question. And it seems that I, I think that, of course, in the future, we will know much more about these pathways. But what we do know is that uh, the cold receptors will send a signal to our temperature regulating center in, in the brain, so hypothalamus. Um, and that's going to be um, taking in this message. And we have so many cold receptors in the skin, so it's going to be very fast. As you can say, if you immerse the body into cold water, this is going to be so rapid. Uh, so it will have a rapid increase in uh, neurotransmitters in the brain, so no adrenaline, adrenaline and cortisol, and, uh, which is not that much, but it's, but it's still there. So you have this increase in uh, no adrenaline, which will then immediately activate the brown fat um, because the, you can say the activator is the most potent one, cold and no adrenaline, and that's going to activate the brown fat. But there's also a direct pathway from the cold receptors in the skin to the, to the brown fat, which really shows that if because of these different pathways, it shows that, that it could be that this tissue to keep us warm was... was developed in, in our evolvement uh, as humans to keep us warm and to save us whenever the temperature on our, on our skin varies just a little bit to keep us in that right homeostatic balance so we don't get hypothermic, um, but also so we don't get hyperthermic because it seems that the brown fat is also activated when we get warmer on our skin. So it's also um, maybe a temperature regulator in our in our body, but the pathway is, is different. I think it's also a third pathway from directly from the muscles. So the brown fat is also activated, um, even though the the muscles are starting to shiver. So there's a an extra pathway that way to keep our uh, our temperature up. So muscles and brown fat are working together to to keep us warm, so we don't uh, suffer too much in the in the cold water. It's super interesting. And what I hear you pointing to is the existence of three parallel pathways. And this notion of parallel pathways comes up over and over again in biology, as you and I know. And I mean, I think it's important for people to know about because 
um, as you uh, said so uh, so eloquently, the when something is very important to our survival or and or evolution, the brain and body uh, install multiple mechanisms for it, not just one. And um, and so it sounds like it's cold skin, cold on the skin triggers an, a response in the hypothalamus, which then activates brown fat cold receptors in the skin directly to the brown fat and then shivering in the muscle to the brown fat. Um, I want to talk about brown fat in depth and learn from you more about brown fat. Um, before that, however, I want to ask about shiver. Um, I've heard that shiver causes the release of succinate, um, which then activates the brown fat. Is it known whether or not inducing shiver is important? And when should pe people shiver? I mean, I've gotten into cold plunges and shivered while I was in there. And then I've also had the experience of getting into a cold plunge or a cold shower, then getting out, or even standing outside on a warm day after swimming in a pool and then starting to shiver. So the shiver comes later. So how important is shiver and does it matter when shiver happens? Yeah, well, shivering is, is good because that increases your metabolism and that's going to burn some calories in your body. You shouldn't be so afraid of shivering, I think, because the shivering, as long as you don't get too hypothermic, so if you don't, if you don't sit in the cold water for too long, sure. um, and what you just said by shivering after you get up, that is because of the after drop. Something called the after drop is when your core temperature uh, decreases even after you get out of the cold water. And it always does that, um, your body, because it, as soon as you get into the cold water, uh, all the, uh, your blood vessels is going to constrict because you need to keep your uh, blood in your core and, and keep your uh, vital organs warm. So as soon as you get up, that, those blood vessels will open again and the warm blood will flow out and get colder and then flow back again into the core. And that's going to decrease the temperature in your core, of course. So that's the drop. So that's the drop. Got yeah, it. Oh, I'm so glad you explained that. <laughs> I've heard um, years ago, Wim Hof, I heard him talk about the drop and I've heard colleagues of mine talk about the drop, but that's the first time I've ever heard it explained clearly. Let me, let me make sure I understand this. So um, I get into cold water, obviously I'm cold. Vessels constrict to keep blood near the center of my body, keep me alive. I get out. The warming up of my body allows those vessels and capillaries to dilate again. The blood goes out to the surface, but the surface is still cold. And so that blood is cooled. And then my core body temperature drops. And that's what you're referring to as the drop. And that's what induces shiver. Exactly. Great. And then am I right in thinking that then the shiver activates brown fat, which then warms me up again? Yes. Got it. That's why you should end on the cold. We can get back to that. Yeah, let's talk yeah. about it. Yes. <laughs> Ending on cold is, um, it, you know, it's what I refer to as and what has now become known as the Soberg principle, which is um, a really important principle about the importance of ending on cold. Um and not doing what I do, which is to get into a hot shower or, or back in the sauna. But we'll, we'll get back to that in a, in a few minutes. So um, that's wonderful um, that you can explain that so clearly because I think that shiver is something that a lot of people do avoid. People think, oh, I don't want the, yeah. you know, the chattering of the teeth. And, yeah. um, and it, it feels like a loss of bodily control, which really it is. It's, it's an autonomic response. Yeah, but I don't think that people should should avoid it that much. It's just like seeing shivering as a way of your body in a, in a like it's training. It's training for your for all your cells. It's training for your muscles. It's training of your metabolism, and that's going to increase your what's called the insulin sensitivity. So if you can like in your mind get used to the thought of shivering is just like when you go exercising in the training center and get that feeling of like, oh, this is tough. Now it hurts a little bit. Yeah, it's going to hurt because that's what shivering also does. But it's just a different way of training your cells in your body. It's going to create what is healthy stress. It's called homesis in the cells. And the more you expose your, your muscle cells or your brown fat cells to these kind of like healthy stresses, exercise, cold, and heat, exposure, it's going to make them uh, better at like activating and also um, at uh, keeping you healthy. So as long as the, the cells get exposed to this, it, it's going to keep them on its toes, you can say, because it becomes more robust, um, increasing these heat shock proteins and cold shock proteins in the cells to um, make you uh, more robust for the next time. And that is also what happens when you go to the training center. And I keep like drawing that parallel because pub 
people today know more about, we know more about exercise and what that uh, is, is going to do to your muscle cells. Um, and But the same kind of like training is also what you do when you go out and, and into the cold water and submerge into cold water because that is just uh, your cold training center, you can say that. And, and also your heat training center going into the sauna because the cells are getting stronger with hormetic stress. So it's the same process, just different practices. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you brought up the fact that the discomfort or the embarrassment or both of shiver is still crucial to uh, actually to reach for and try and experience the same way that with exercise. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize this, but when we did our series with Dr. Andy Galpin, it became clear to me what should have already been clear to me. And I think that most people don't realize, which is that if we were to measure um, heart rate, blood pressure, um, stress hormones, and inflammation in a human being during exercise, it would look as if they were ready to die. Blood <laughs> pressure would be high. Inflammation is yeah. through the roof. But all of that is setting in motion an ad adaptation or set of adaptations that allow blood pressure to be lower at rest, that allow um, inflammation markers to be lower at rest, all the things that everybody is seeking with exercise, in, in addition to, of course, the aesthetic changes that people are seeking with exercise. Sounds like the exact same things are happening with the cold. So um, the redundant message here seems to be that the more discomfort, provided it's done safely, just like with exercise, the more shivering, the, um, the more cold shock, provided it's not to the extreme and stop somebody's heart, right? We can talk about thresholds for that a little bit later. It sounds like all of that is going to set in motion some long-term changes that will make people feel better and will improve health. Could you just touch on a few of the longer-term changes that are known to occur? I mean, I'm well aware of the study showing that, uh, I think it was European Journal of Physiology, it was uh, the European Journal of Physiology, showing long-lasting increases in catecholamines, dopamine, norepinephrine, and um, epinephrine for many hours after deliberate cold exposure. What are some of the other things that happen at the level of metabolism and brown fat in, let's say, the hours and um, day after a deliberate cold exposure? As soon as you go in, of course, there's an activation. But it seems like, no, you're asking for the, the later outcomes like blood pressure and stuff like that. Is that what you mean? Yeah, blood pressure, but also in terms of metabolism. I know that you know in your study, you should, and we'll talk about brown fat in depth here in a moment, but yeah. that there were changes to the brown fat that equate to changes in, for instance, people's ability to be comfortable in colder oh, yeah. environments when they're not doing deliberate cold exposure yeah. or in the same way that I can um, exercise on an exercise bike or go out for a hard run. But then if I go hiking uh, with the family on Sunday and where it's a steep climb, I could do that steep climb more easily because I'm quote unquote fit as yeah. a consequence of the, of the exercise. What are, so, uh, what are some of the fitness adaptations of deliberate cold exposure? Yeah. So what happens is that you you get adapted a little bit every time you go. So you will, like exercise, get a little bit stronger. So every time you go into the cold water, for every time you will be more exposed to it, you will, you will feel more comfortable in the cold. So you're going you're gonna to build your adaptation, which happens on a metabolic level, which is going to be the brown fat. So you will have more activation of your brown fat. The mitochondria in the, the brown fat cells are going to be, um, you have more of those and they will be more efficient at heating you up because it expects, the body expects you to, to do this again. So you are prepared in a way. The capillaries in your skin is also, will also become better at like constricting. So you will have a better shield of your body to uh, prepare you for the next time. So you will be, become better at uh, going into the cold water in that way. So the, the body makes these mechanisms and changes your body in a way so you can expose yourself to the next time, right? And, uh, and also you will have um, also uh, your um, stress response will also be uh, subside a bit. So you will have a less increase of your uh, catecholamines um, with time. With time also, you have, because of this activation of your uh, brown fat or your muscles, you will have an increase in, um, uh, in, in your metabolism, which will then uh, make your insulin sensitivity uh, better. And this is shown in, in studies. For example, um, there's this interesting study I found just before I, I started my PhD, which was from um, Gibor Stormer um, et al. from 2016, where they measured um, metabolism uh, not in or not on brown fat, but they measured insulin sensitivity in middle-aged men and women uh, during one winter swimming season. 
So they were not very young like they were in my study, uh, but they were they were middle aged, and I think this is very interesting. So they, during these four or five months they were winter swimming, they saw that they had a lower blood pressure after the season, and they had a lower heart rate, and they also saw that they have a better insulin sensitivity. And I think that is very interesting because if you can have a better insulin sensitivity, you can prevent lifestyle diseases. So, um, and we lower blood pressure, which is a a very strong outcome also for telling how much inflammation you have in the body. And because it didn't measure uh, brown fat, um, I figured that it could be that was the missing link. That was one of the explanations to why we see this um, less inflammation in the body. So um, the longer outcomes, uh, the long-term outcomes could be that you lower your blood pressure and you have a lower heart rate. Um, you also um, have a better insulin sensitivity and a better glucose balance, but that was shown. That is shown in my study. I'd like to take a quick break and acknowledge one of our sponsors, Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens, now called AG1, is a vitamin mineral probiotic drink that covers all of your foundational nutritional needs. I've been taking Athletic Greens since 2012, so I'm delighted that they're sponsoring the podcast. The reason I started taking Athletic Greens and the reason I still take Athletic Greens once or usually twice a day is that it gets to me the probiotics that I need for gut health. Our gut is very important. It's populated by gut microbiota that communicate with the brain, the immune system, and basically all the biological systems of our body to strongly impact our immediate and long-term health. And those probiotics in Athletic Greens are optimal and vital for microbiotic health. In addition, Athletic Greens contains a number of adaptogens, vitamins, and minerals that make sure that all of my foundational nutritional needs are met. And it tastes great. If you'd like to try Athletic Greens, you can go to athleticgreens.com slash Huberman, and they'll give you five free travel packs that make it really easy to mix up Athletic Greens while you're on the road, in the car, on the plane, et cetera. And they'll give you a year's supply of vitamin D3K2. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash Huberman to get the five free travel packs and the year's supply of vitamin D3K2. And we'll get back to the uh, insulin sensitivity and glucose balance. Um, that's a in, an impressive list of benefits. Um, you know, blood pressure, of course, most people are aware of blood pressure and what it is. It's what they measure when we go to the doctor. And um, it's not very sexy nowadays, you know, blood pressure, people go, oh, you know, blood pressure. It's not, you know, people want to hear about the inflammatome and the microbiome and all of that stuff is really interesting. But um, I think that blood pressure doesn't get enough attention. Um, and we have spoken to, on this podcast, to Dr. Peter Atia who um, is an expert in longevity and health span and things of that sort. And and I was surprised to learn, again, I shouldn't have been surprised, that the number one reason people die worldwide is cerebral vascular disease and cardiovascular disease. And there are basically three things on the list of things to address. Uh, One is not smoking Mm -hmm. um, or vaping, by the way. Uh, Not smoking. There are a few other things uh, related to blood markers, ApoB and things of that sort. But then the big one is blood pressure. And so it's, it's interesting because we don't think about blood pressure that much anymore um, as, a, as the kind of people interested in health optimization and health, but blood pressure is so vital to control. So it's wonderful to hear that deliberate cold exposure is one way to control blood pressure. I, I'm guessing in concert with other forms of exercise. Yeah. Um, let's talk about brown fat. And um, if, you, if you're willing, I'd love to drill into brown fat at a, at a deep level. Um, again, uh, my understanding of this is, is far more elementary than yours. Obviously you're the expert. My understanding about brown fat is that it's located in specific areas of our body. Uh, maybe more widespread than when I learned in school. I thought it was, uh, I was taught it was just at the clavicles and the back of the neck and upper back, but who knows? I learned that there's more of it when we're children, maybe more distributed throughout our body and that it's rich in mitochondria. What is so special about the brown fat? Like if we could just go into the biology of brown fat a little bit, what does it look like? Uh, You've measured it in human subjects. Where is it distributed really? Can it expand its distribution? Can we activate and expand the amount of brown fat as adults? And um, for those of you that are cringing already thinking we're talking about getting fatter, it's quite the opposite. We're talking about not subcutaneous fat, but fat located around the the organs. But please educate me. um, Tell me where I'm wrong and um, expand my knowledge on brown fat. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, you are not wrong, but um, it's definitely it's true that there are more locations uh, of the brown fat uh, than we previously thought. Um, there is this very nice uh, study from 2017 by Leitner et al., where they uh, had made these uh, PET CTs uh, overlays of um, their subjects, where you can see where in the body do we have brown fat and where can we grow more brown fat, um, so to say. Um, so the brown fat is can, is very plastic, so it means that it can it can grow and it can decrease, and this is proven in in studies where we have seen um, um, people with the fail cryocytoma is like a very specific cancer type where people where from the 70s where we can see that if they have this specific kind of uh, cancer type um they have a t- they have this tumor on the uh, adrenal gland so they have like an, a huge increase in noradrenaline and because of that they have this continuous activation of the brown fat and they ha- have grown a lot of brown fat in the whole body uh, or abdomen or where it's located in these six different places but it is less like very much compared to like normal people. Um, and what they then see, uh, what we learned from this study is that brown fat can apparently grow if you have um, an increase in no adrenaline in the body. It's not like you want that because when that happens, you have a high blood pressure. You don't want it chronically, right? You, you just want it on like a short amount of time and then it can grow for a bit, but you don't want it chronically, of course not. But because it, it activates also your sympathetic nervous system. So they have also showed they had high blood pressure. They had, uh, they lost a lot of weight, of course, because this is activating your metabolism. So they, they found luckily that when they uh, removed this be, uh, benign uh, tumor, uh, that uh, the brown fat um, decreases again to normal size and they gain weight again and they had uh, normal blood pressure. So the story ends well. <laughs> but it's kind of like proof of concept of the brown fat can actually grow. So it's plastic in its in its way of like it can, it can grow and it can decrease again. So that's very good. Good studies to to see what, it, what the body is capable of. But we don't, of course, want all that brown fat. We just want it to be, um, we just want to keep it, actually, and, and keep it activated. Because what we see in studies is also that after the age of 40, um, people, um, uh, studies have shown that there is an association with having less brown fat, but increased obesity. So, of course, we, we don't know yet whether uh, brown fat decreases with age and therefore we get obese or we get obese and therefore we have less brown fat, but as brown fat is an insulin-sensitive organ in our body and we get obese, uh, just like the muscles get less sensitive, um, insulin-sensitive, the brown fat does as well, and therefore it maybe decreases. It could be a theory uh, mm-hmm. that I think could be one of the reasons why we, we don't see that much brown fat in, in elderly uh, people. Some have a lot especially people working outside. There, there are studies showing this. Who uh, People who, um, who work outside. do physical work outside, outside. farmers yeah. and yeah. Um, yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. They it's, expose themselves to it. So mm-hmm. it, they'll, they'll just keep it in that way. Mm-hmm. It's um, And I suppose we should um, clarify for people in case they don't know that insulin sensitivity is a very good thing. You want yeah. that. You want your cells yeah. to be sensitive to insulin. Um, insulin insensitivity is type two diabetes um, and is associated with obesity. Um, so just a point of clarification there. Uh, yeah, it's interesting to me. I, I I usually work out at home, but I, I go to a gym once or twice a week if I can, because it's good if I see uh, the outside world. Um, <laughs> and there are a few individuals at the, the gym who are, they're not particularly large or muscular, um, but they are incredibly um, lean and their posture is great, presumably from the musculoskeletal work. Um, and they, they're in their 70s and 80s. I mean, it's remarkable, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And, um, and I know all the telltale signs of hormone augmentation. I'm very good at spotting that. There are a few telltale <laughs> signs. I've talked about this on other podcasts. And they're not, they're, that's not why they're, 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 um, they're fit. They're, they're, they're clearly of that look. And you see this outside the gym too, of course, for people that look like they've done a lot of physical labor their whole life. Yeah. They're just moving a lot. They, they have strong hands and features and they're, they're um, and they're not necessarily excessively lean, but you can tell that they've been using their musculoskeletal yeah. system 
And I like to talk to these people and ask them like, not what are you doing now for your workout, but what, what did you grow up doing? You know? And I would say, and obviously I haven't run statistics on this, but more than 75% of them respond that they grew up on a farm or that they did some sort of manual labor or were a postman or a postwoman or doing something where they moved a lot for their early years and throughout middle age. And most of them are now in retirement, but some of them are still working and they all still moving a lot. So the relationship between shiver and brown fat makes sense to me. But is it the case that as we're just moving around, um, I've heard of NEAT, non-exercise um, induced thermogenesis. So if we're just moving around, um, that we are activating brown fat or do, does there need to be this stressor? Does there need to be shiver and a cold stimulus or a heat stimulus to activate the brown fat? In other words, um, is just staying active enough or do we need to do some sort of temperature uh, shock type thing like deliberate cold exp exposure? Yeah, I think that is a really good question because how, how, also, why do we have this tissue? Then, if it's if it has to be extreme, then you can question what what do we need this tissue for? But it seems that you can activate the brown fat with just a little bit of exposure to to cold. So cold is the, the most potent stressor activator of uh, our brown fat because it's our temperature regulating uh, organ in our body. So first responder to that. So the muscles will be a little bit too late, uh, and therefore we have maybe these two kind of tissues. So. Actually, just uh, exposing yourself or a hand, actually, just to cold water. So studies have shown um, that if you just put your hand in cold water, not that you're going to gonna do that all day or or every day or anything. It's not a, it's it's not something you have to do. But it just shows that you can activate your brown fat just by getting a temperature change on your skin. So you can go outside in t-shirts. That's why also we were just talking about well, people who works outside or move a lot or get out, in and out of it, like changing the temperature of their body all the time, they will have more brown fat. And uh, activating that is going to keep your metabolism higher and your insulin sensitivity uh, study have also shown this. So the brown fat can be activated as soon as you just change your temperature in the skin. So going outside in a t-shirt, wearing cooling vests, also studies have shown this for 10 days, it's going to also uh, grow your, uh, your brown fat. So you can get more brown fat if you expose yourself to the cold. You don't have to start in a cold uh, shower. You don't have to start in a cold uh, plunge if you're not really ready for that yet. But just exposing yourself to the cold wind has also shown to activate your brown fat. Or if you don't want to be like uh, in this uh, awake state, uh, uh, then you can also just sleep in the cold and you won't notice it that much maybe. But studies have shown that if you sleep in 19 degrees Celsius, um, then you will activate your uh, brown fat and you will grow your brown fat. So you have more of it. So this uh, very nice studies um, from Hansen et al. from 2017 showed that a, a group of subjects who slept in a room at 24 degrees, and then they made this PET CT scanning to see how much brown fat do they have from the beginning. So what we call baseline. Then they measured again after um, a month of sleeping in 19 degrees. And they saw, I think it's remarkable, just one month at 19 degrees sleeping there. They had a duvet on and they were still had clothes on when they were sleeping. So they're under a cover, under a yeah, duvet? Yeah, under, under uh -huh. a duvet, yeah. 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 Okay. The subjects were sleeping at 19 degrees for one month, had increased his insulin sensitivity. The next month they slept at 24 degrees. They measured this again and then they had decreased actually a little bit. And then they slept at 27 degrees, so quite warm room actually for, for the uh, fourth month. Um, and they saw uh, even less uh, activation of the brown fat and also insulin sensitivity. So it seems that you can expose yourself and pretty rapidly, the brown fat will respond to this because it's so sensitive to noradrenaline, right? So if you keep exposing yourself to a little bit of cold, you will also get a little bit adapted to it. But that's because the brown fat um, has grown these more mitochondria in the cells. So these small energy fabrics, that's going to activate the cells and that's going to take up glucose and fat from the fatty acids from the bloodstream to keep uh, the thermogenesis up. And that's going to clear up some sugar and it's going to clear uh, so in the, in the bloodstream and some, some fat as well. So the brown fat can in that way decrease uh, our unhealthy fat, which is the white fat. Um, and the white fat is what we don't want too much of, but we still need some, of course. Um, 
and it's our energy storage. So it's very important that it's there. We just don't need a, a lot of it. So on our thighs and also around our inner organs, that's where it's it's located. So if we can have activation of the brown fat just by going out in the cold and just by sleeping in a cold room, or if you are, have courage for it, you can go out and expose yourself in a cold plunge. Um, cold showers is also going to do the trick. So you can do different variations of this. Just exposing yourself to various temperatures is going to activate the brown fat because it was involved to keep us in a perfect homeostatic balance regarding temperature. So to keep us alive. Incredible. Uh, I want to just get a clarification around this 19 degrees Celsius um, room that they're sleeping in. So they're under a comforter, a duvet, and, um, and you mentioned they had clothes on. Uh, the room is 19 degrees Celsius, but the temperature underneath their blanket might not be 19 degrees Celsius. So presumably it's the cold on their face that's activating uh, the, the increase in uh, brown fat that was observed. Is that, is that a reasonable uh, expectation? I, I think so, yeah, because it's you have so many uh, cold receptors in your face, as, uh, so it's actually it's enough, and it, I think it corresponds very well with the studies showing that you can activate the brown fat just by putting a hand into a, a bucket of cold water. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did this experiment myself in in my studies just to see how well did they uh, respond to cold water. So it was uh, four degrees Celsius cold water for four minutes, and then I just measured blood pressure and heart rate to see do they have like an activation of this. I actually also measured the brown fat during this uh, cold exposure for four minutes with an infrared thermography camera to see, can I see that the brown fat is activated? And just be, just to tell, uh, go back to the location of the brown fat. So usually you cannot really see activation of your brown fat because it's located uh, centrally in your uh, uh, around your central nervous system. Um, and, and the biggest depot, as you mentioned before, is up here uh, under the the clavicular bones, so um, and very close to the skin surface. And because it's so close to the skin surface, I could measure it with this very expensive camera. Yeah, and it's not very feasible for people to go home and do this. <laughs> Don't because it takes a lot of practice, I can tell. Um, but we measured the brown fat with this, um, and, and I could see that after a few minutes that the activation was there, an increase in temperature uh, arose from that. Um, activation, just four minutes. So it's very rapid. And I'm also measured in my study, how deep was the brown fat under your skin? So it's very close to the surface, which also shows that it, it needs to be there to, to heat you up and heat, heat your inner organs. Well, I'm delighted to hear all of this. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, one is by way of anecdote. I mentioned a little bit earlier that as an undergraduate, I worked in a lab that studied thermogenesis and we were doing that in animals, but we had this room that was very cold. Uh -huh. The whole room was cold. Uh, the guy who I worked for at the time, and I'm Harry Carlisle, is a very accomplished physiologist. He came from this lineage. I don't know if this literature is still um, discussed much, but it's a beautiful literature um, uh, from Rothwell and Stock. They were the ones who discovered um, non-exercise induced thermogenesis. The fact that people bounce, who bounce their legs a lot and move around a lot and oh, have yeah. a lot of kind of yeah. um, stochastic movement um, burn up to 18, 1,800 calories more per day than people who sit more still. Fascinating. Incredible. Yeah. It, just incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that work uh, gets as much attention as, as it deserves. Published in journals like Nature, so very uh, fine journals. But in any event, uh, one of the things that I noticed when I started working in that laboratory was that I was cold because the room was cold. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. Carlisle, Harry, um, said, well, the key is to wear a t-shirt in here for about two or three days, yeah. and then you will cold adapt. I thought, well, wouldn't I want to put on a hoodie and get warm in there so I was comfortable? And he said, no, actually what you want to do is get yourself uncomfortably cold, activate your brown fat. And indeed, when I did that, I think it was just two days of being in that cold environment. Then I could come back on the third day and be perfectly comfortable yeah. because the brown fat had expanded um, or, or added mitochondria or both. And I was perfectly comfortable in that environment. I also got very, very lean in those, um, in those days and weeks. Now, I've, I've never been somebody who's very lean, nor am I somebody who carries a lot of excess adipose tissue. I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. I'm sure I could adjust that with feeding if I want to. <laughs> but it was, it was striking uh, what a powerful effect it had on my entire system of thermal regulation. And one of the things that I uh, also delighted in when Cell Reports um, Medicine published your study is they had an accompanying um, press release 
that went out to, to those of us that received press releases. And it described a, um, a saying in Scandinavia, which is um, essentially, tr I'm not going to attempt to uh, speak uh, Danish, even though I have uh, much of my family is in Denmark, uh, believe it or not, from Denmark. Um, we have a lot of Danes in my family. Um, I won't embarrass myself by trying to speak Danish as I did before the, the uh, microphones were rolling. But um, that there's a saying that I, th I think essentially uh, translates to in the fall, when, w when you're approaching winter, mm -hmm. you want to actually wear fewer layers not bundle up when you go outside so that you can prepare yourself for the cold of winter and be able to heat yourself up using your brown fat. And that in the spring, as the temperatures are warming, rather than removing layers, you want to wear more layers yeah. in order to be a little bit uncomfortably warm so that in the heat of the summer, you're better at cooling your body. Do I have that right? And yeah, maybe, yeah. do you know the saying and would you be willing to share it? Yeah, only the Swedes and, um, uh, and Danes will be able to understand. Um, Maybe the Norwegians too. If you don't know it, that's okay. Yeah. So I know that I know the the concept of it because we say it. You should you should wear less before winter and uh, and more before summer. Oh, so well, there it yeah, is in yeah. English. So, so. I, it doesn't have to be esoteric. <laughs> but okay. Yeah, and and you're completely right. And I think this is the, the this is just something that we know in the Scandinavian countries. I think that we 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 in, intuitively know this. But if we just go back a little bit in history. I think that um, around the 1950s, the, uh, the Russian government went out and said, well, we should do something about the tu tuberculosis uh, um, pandemic uh, or epidemic that was at that, this time. So they, they wanted to have the, the people um, be more resilient to the cold and also increase our immune uh, system. So in Scandinavia, and actually also in Russia, we uh, put our babies outside to sleep uh, in the prom. And that is like to uh, also to, to get more resistant to the cold, but also to increase our uh, immune system. And we still do that in Denmark. So we... Do you really? Yeah, we do. Babies yeah. are taken out in the cold? In the snow, in frosty rain, everything. My two boys have been sleeping out in winter for at least the fir their first many three, four, five years because it's like very good for them and they get uh, a better uh, immune system and get resilient to the cold so they will have less colds. And also they run around in a t-shirt when it's super cold because they have activated all their brown fat. I didn't understand at that time, I must say, I must say but I kind of like intuitively also knew because we have inherited this uh, way of doing things with our culture. So, and I have heard people coming from the U.S. saying oh, Danes are crazy. They put their babies outside and proms and leave them there, and then they go inside and drink coffee on the cafe. <laughs> <laughs> well, that. I don't think Danes are crazy. I I I, I adore the Danes. No. Um, they're yeah. they're amazing uh, culture and people. I'm so fortunate to have family members uh, from Denmark. But I did notice. So when when we were in Copenhagen, and, and I know. Um, we, we saw you there uh, uh, not long ago. That was June. Um, the water in the harbor was co was cold yeah. for, for even though the Pacific is close to here, uh, which is very cold. Uh, it felt pretty cold, but I, it was summertime-ish. Um, so people were in summertime mode, right? T-shirts and shorts and things of that, that sort. But it did strike me that people in Copenhagen are dramatically fitter than they are in the United States. I mean, first of all, everyone's bicycling everywhere. Yeah. Um, not many people wearing sunglasses. So trying to extract as much photon energy from the sun as possible, which I support. Uh, as everyone knows, that's a, I'm a big fan of getting sun. But also um, when we did see swimmers, um, they were swimming in this cold water and like it was nothing. And they're the range and age of the swimmers was what was remarkable. You saw the kind of fit triathlete looking types, but also young kids, like really young kids. And then people probably in their, again, their, their 70s, 80s, 80s maybe even yeah. 90s. Yeah. Really uh, remarkable, uh, vastly different than what you see if you go to the ocean here in uh, Los Angeles or, or elsewhere. So um, yeah, you Scandinavians are onto something with this. I'd like to take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Inside Tracker. Inside Tracker is a personalized nutrition platform that analyzes data from your blood and DNA to help you better understand your body and help you reach your health goals. I've long been a believer in getting regular blood work done for the simple reason that many of the factors that impact your immediate and long-term health can only be assessed 
with a quality blood test. The problem with a lot of blood and DNA tests out there, however, is that they'll give you information about certain lipid markers or hormone markers, but no information about what to do with all of that data. Inside Tracker makes it very easy to look at your levels of hormones, metabolic factors, lipids, et cetera, and then to assess what sorts of behavioral, nutritional, supplementation, or perhaps other interventions you might want to use in order to bring those numbers into the ranges that are optimal for your health. Inside Tracker's ultimate plan now includes three new hormone markers that are critical to measure during a woman's reproductive and menopausal years. These are estradiol, progesterone, and thyroid stimulating hormone. If you'd like to try Inside Tracker, you can go to insidetracker.com slash Huberman to get 20% off any of Inside Tracker's plans. Again, that's insidetracker.com slash Huberman to get 20% off. I'd like to talk about your study. Um, if you could give us a little bit of the backdrop about what motivated that study. And then, um, and then walk us through what you did, you know, who the subjects were, um, what you had them do, what you measured um, in as much detail as you would like to share, because I think it's such an important, you know, even I, fair to say landmark study, because it also explored not just cold, but sauna and the, the co-use of cold and sauna as a way to probe metabolism and brown fat and other markers as well. And as you do this, uh, I'm hoping at some point that you might um, tell us some of the observations that you might've made that interested you that perhaps were not in the paper, because that's one of the great benefits of sitting across from somebody who, who did the work in detail. So um, yeah, if you could tell us about your study um, and uh, what you did and what you discovered. Thank you for that question, Andrew. I, I love to like also explain a little bit what did we do because when people read this kind of paper they just see the numbers they don't see what what happened before that and human studies are very different from from my study my studies you can do a knockout of something and then everything is like perfectly matched and controlled doing human studies is very far different from that because people are different even in the groups so yeah but what we um when I started this research in 2016, I did not really know what the brown fat was. So I started reading up on all this and I was very interested in preventive medicine. Um, also, the studies that I did before brown fat was also like very much in, in the preventive side, like how can we, that was about something else, but uh, the sweet tooth and how can we lower our sweet tooth and stuff like that. So, but after that, I wanted to, to do something new. So I looked into the brown fat got hired in this uh, fantastic research group where they, it's a cell group. So they mostly did cell studies and they didn't have anyone to do a human study yet. Um, and, um, but they really wanted me to, to do that. So I read upon a lot of research about how does the brown fat get activated? What have been done already? And I mentioned the paper before with sleeping in the cold. I found that particular paper very fascinating. And that was also where um, at that time, I was like, okay, so cold exposure as an intervention of sleeping in the cold could be a good thing to go out and say, well, people do this. But on the other hand is, first of all, it was already done. <laughs> that was one thing. But the other thing was like, well, I wanted to, to see if we can do an, like some kind of activity so we can have people move also, or go and do something, do something together or whatever. And, and, and the cold uh, made us think about, well, what about winter swimming? And it was kind of like a bit of a joke in the beginning. It's like winter swimming. Yeah, it's going to activate the brown fat, right? <laughs> but, but when we read the literature, we couldn't really find anything about activation of the brown fat with cold water besides hand in a bucket of cold water that really, that was already there. So we were just thinking, okay, so it should be very potent. Um, activation of the brown fat if it's cold water, but very different from cold air. So it was kind of also a new thing we were going into. And uh, we knew that we were going to do like a more of a, um, a proof of concept study um, at the beginning of it, because it was like winter swimmers um, must, in theory, activate the brown fat, right? But we kind of didn't really know was, was this kind of stressor too much, too little, or what will happen actually. But we had this idea about, well, we always say that cold water and winter swimming will activate your metabolism. But do, but do we know if it do, does that? No, we don't. So, um, and while this idea was a little bit f fun, fun at the beginning, um, we kind of accepted. It was like, okay, let's just try this out. But because we didn't have the funding for it, we was like, okay, let's do a proof of concept study. 
um, let's go with a small number, but enough to see um, a difference between the groups. So the power calculation of that study is done on uh, what we know uh, from PET-CT scannings of the brown fat. So that's the main outcome of that, of course. So, um, and we wanted to go a little bit small on the numbers of, of participants because we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into the different mechanisms and also redo some of the, the, the days. So I really wanted to do that to see if I can replicate also the findings. And that's going to take a lot of, a lot of uh, funding, but it's also going to take a lot of time to do it. Um, so the proof of concept was just going small, but looking at different mechanisms. We also took um, uh, fat biopsies, for example, and looked at the white fat to see if there was any differences between the groups before and after and stuff like that. So that's kind of like how it started. And, and, and the first year was like a field study for me. So I was not a winter swimmer when I started this. It was just... Oh, really? No, I wasn't um, at all. And I, I would say I was a bit afraid of the cold myself. A um, mm. bit of a cold sissy, uh, always cold, having big socks on and sweaters and stuff like that. So I was like, I am so comfortable. I'm just like everybody else, very comfortable. I like being com completely temperature neutral. Um, but I started like playing with this thought, like, well, if this is so healthy, in theory, I should not pack myself up. I should start not doing that. Yeah, but the first year observation of winter swimmers on the jetty, they kind of joked about it, say, come on, Zanu, you need to try this. You cannot study this un unless you have tried it. And I was like, haha, very funny. Of course I can do that. <laughs> but I couldn't. I, I read the literature. I understood in theory what happens when you go into cold water. But I completely understood it when I first tried it. The first few times, not so funny. It felt painful. It was just like running too long uh, after a long break and you and your muscles hurt the day after, right? You you completely regret that you took that extra mile. <laughs> what about when you say uncomfortable, you mean uncomfortable when you got in and when you were in or uncomfortable afterwards? Because I, I find that um, on rare occasions, well, I should just, uh, full disclosure, I, I do deliberate cold exposure every morning uh, for about a minute to two minutes in a cold plunge. There are days that I miss. But when I'm at home, I do that. And when I travel, I do a cold shower. I do finish with a warm shower. <laughs> so, um, and we'll talk about why that's probably not the best idea. But, um, and I've been doing it for some years now, um, on and off. Uh, but, uh, so just full disclosure, I'm a devotee. Um, and I have family members that uh, hate the, the cold, but have gotten into it and, and are starting to like it. But they don't, and I don't necessarily like the experience in the cold water, but I love the way I feel when I get After. out. And I have, I'm a hundred percent on that statement about loving it when I get out. Occasionally it feels good to be in there. It feels invigorating. And I think I've learned to control the gas reflex and the hyperventilation. And I just have told myself what we know, which is that the forebrain struggles to engage for the first 20 or 30 seconds. But if you can get past that wall, it's, it's far easier to, to push through. Um, but when you say that it was really uncomfortable, do you mean the experience of getting in or you also felt lousy afterward? Yeah. It's, and very important to clear that out. I only felt very uncomfortable doing it at the moment, but afterwards, the first time I went uh, with, uh, with a group and actually my husband was as, as well, because I, I really wanted someone I knew, um, coming along because it's very normal if you haven't done this before you feel a little bit anxious about it and this is shown in studies as well because blood pressure and heart rate goes up in in those who are new to this kind of activity so um i was a little bit anxious about it so it was really uncomfortable just doing it but afterwards as soon as i got up i felt fantastic mm -hmm. and we went into the sauna and i did three rounds because i just loved it I love the feeling afterwards because you have all these neurotransmitters going in your brain and you feel more positive. You feel, I feel invigorated. I had so much energy uh, and that like I, I could totally see why people would do this to get energy throughout the day because I definitely had that. I didn't have to do three dips to, to get that. I think one would be enough. And I often do that also now today. I do one dip. Sometimes I do two or three uh, dips um, in, in one round. You can say in one day. But uh, often it's like just one or two times a week. For me, that is enough to, to get that energy and to get that positive feeling. And, and I think that that is also why I 
I put up my study in that way. I wanted to study the lowest dose, you can say, the lowest amount that we can get away with, but still see um, health benefits. So what I observed there on the jetty was that some did it a long time. They were in the water for a very long time. And to me, it seemed maybe a little bit extreme. Could you give me an example of long time? Well, so maybe they were like really swimming and mm -hmm. they could be 20 minutes or half an hour. That's a long time. That's a long time. And there was like ice and people who came up. I, I mean, I just didn't really feel that this is a, something that I wanted to go out and recommend to people after yeah, you my You didn't want PhD. any of your research subjects dying either <laughs> because if you're not adapted, I mean, no. people, you know, people can do that. Also a 20 minute cold shower or 20 minute cold plunge. I know people do it, but it's probably not a good idea. No, probably yeah. not. It's going to exhaust your cells and eat them, make them age too fast. Mm -hmm. So exactly. Mm -hmm. That's uh, when you pass that hormetic stress, this, the healthy stress level, that's what is happening. The quite opposite is, is a almost chronic stress, actually, in the cells. Well, what happened then was that um, I found out if, if I want to have this protocol get through ethical committee, I, I really needed to go like very like sleek with the not too long and, and make sure that they were also very healthy and and to get approval, of course, of this study. Um, but what I did was to to recruit winter swimmers who already have been swimming for two or three seasons. And I just observed them. I said, I'm not going to do an intervention study yet. I did that after. But I, I wanted to do like a proof of concept where they were already adapted to the cold and then compare them to a matched control group who were matched on... Um, on, you can say, diet. So were they vegetarian or not? Um, and one of them was in each group. Uh, also, They weren't all vegetarians. No, no, no. Okay. Just one in each group. Yeah. I was going to say, with all the amazing fish and meat in uh, <laughs> in Denmark, I'd have a hard time being a vegetarian. Yeah. No, the no, breads no. are amazing, the fruits and vegetables too. But okay, yeah. so there were a couple of vegetarians in each group. Yeah, one okay. one in each. Yeah. Okay. And they were messed Token on... vegetarian. <laughs> I have family members who are vegetarian, so I'm just poking fun. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> yeah, but they were they were matched on different things. So what we usually match them on is also BMI. Um, we chose one gender in this study, and we would always choose both men and women normally. But we do see that there are different uh, brown fat levels uh, depending on gender. So women have more brown fat than men. Really? Mm. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Uh, that deserves study. Yeah. Yeah. Why, actually? I think it's interesting because women are also smaller, so in size, and mass, right? But they also have um, a lower peripheral temperature, especially on hands and ears. And Is that and, right? That's that's documented? That yeah. Women do run colder than men? Yeah. And there's Physiologically, also, I didn't say psychologically. <laughs> no, no, no. We won't, we won't go to the psychological cold, cold heat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's different. Yeah. Something else. That's a different podcast. Yeah. <laughs> another time. So women are just colder physically. Uh, so on hands and ears, it's measured on that. Um, and, and, and feet as well. So compared to men. And men have bigger hearts than women, and they can pump out more blood uh, peripheral uh, than in a woman's body. So they, that could be an explanation for the colder hands, for example. Thermal comfortable state is also different between gen genders. So men are more comfortable at 22 degrees Celsius and women are thermal comfortable at 24 degrees Celsius. And this okay, is so the thermostat wars of home have been now validated. <laughs> yes. Okay. yes, there's a study. Two degrees Celsius. This. By the way, prior to um, starting <laughs> recording, uh, I made the executive decision that we were going to go with Celsius throughout the podcast um, because the majority of the world uses Celsius. So for those of you that think in Fahrenheit, um, the internet is your friend in making those conversions. So we're sticking with Celsius. So men tend to be thermo comfortable at 22 degrees Celsius, women at 24. Okay, interesting. Explains a lot about like also some arguments in the homes where men are turning down the heater and women are turning up the heater and they cannot really. So it's, it's really, it's, I'm on both sides here. I understand the men, we understand the women, but it's, there is a difference there, which was also one of the reasons why we had, we in this proof of concept study chose one gender. So it is not like only because we wanted to study men. It was just to see, to eliminate uh, all the confounding factors which could have an impact on, on our results. So um, that was one of the reasons. Um, 
but also because we yeah so women have have more brown fat than men and otherwise we would have to like do four groups or something like that and not having funding yet we were like okay we need to do like just one a group just a control group and then a, and a group who were always the uh, winter swimmers mm-hmm. so i recruited winter swimmers who have been swimming for two to three seasons um because i wanted them to be already adapted but not going too long in the water so they told me uh, i did a lot of screening here of course beforehand and interviews to see to ask them how much do you do and um how much do you how long do you stay in the water and i um, monitored how long did they then stay in the water and recruited based on um that they only did like two to three times per week it seems reasonable uh, for 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 denmark at least <laughs> to do that and they stayed only in the water for one to two minutes. So the cold shock subsides very quickly and you will get this activation of your rest and digest system, which is your parasympathetic nervous system. So the, the other branch of your autonomous nervous system. And you get that activation because you submerge into cold water. And when you do that, you have an activation of your diving response and uh, that's going to slow down the you can say the the consumption of oxygen also in your body and that's going to slow down your heart rate. Could I pause you on this? Because yeah. I've heard this before that when we get into cold water, shower or immersion, uh-huh. we get this sympathetic autonomic response. So yeah. increased blood pressure, increased heart rate, release of norepinephrine from the locus ceruleus in the brain, release of um, adrenaline, dopamine, adrenaline from the from the adrenals, dopamine presumably within the brain. But that the parasympathetic response is activated when we put our face into cold water or go underwater. And that's a calming relaxation response. So this brings us back to, I don't want to take us off track from you describing the study, but this brings us back to the first question, which is if I go completely underwater for a moment, when I start my cold plunge, does that change the physiological outcome as compared to if I just submerge myself up to the neck? And, that, and actually nowadays there seems to be a little bit of a movement online of people putting a bowl of ice water on their countertop and submerging yeah. their face into it. Did yeah. you see this? This is start, I've seen yeah, more yeah. and more posts about yeah. this. So um, could you just touch on the, what the dive reflex is and why it act, perhaps activates the parasympathetic response, this calming response? Well, so the diving reflex is activated when you submerge into cool water. Um, Even just to the neck? Yeah. Or I thought you had to get your face under. I'm not, I'm I'm not not, arguing different. You're the expert. I just want to, yeah. I haven't really, I haven't read that. Mm. I've just seen uh, that you can activate your uh, diving response as as soon as you go underwater with your body. Um, So you don't have to do it with your face as far as I understand. I could, I could be wrong (laughs) though. Um, Yeah. So when, when you activate your uh, diving response, you will slow down your, um, your oxygen consumption in your body. And that is because the body tries to res- preserve um, um, oxygen so you will not get hypothermic too fast. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like a survival system in your body. Um, mm-hmm. So this survival system is very um, important for us, of course. So that will be activated. And uh, because of that, you will have to maybe one minute or so. I'm, I can't be precise on that because I maybe it also varies a bit in, in humans. So one to two minutes you will have full activation of the sympathetic nervous system, but also the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, and that's going to activate, for example, s- something like serotonin in your brain, which is like also good for mental balance and people feeling in mental balance afterwards, They after they go up. You know, so that is like measured on a, a questionnaires and also measure like on, on anecdotes. Of course, people tell all the time that they feel good afterwards. We need studies on this. So if anyone's sitting out there thinking that's interesting, then please do some studies on that yeah, I agree. Uh, to, to get more uh, out on that. Yeah. So you had, so you observe these winter swimmers who are done this for a few seasons. Yeah. They're coming around for a new season of winter swimming and you've decided to recruit them as subjects. They are getting into cold water um, climbing down a ladder or jumping into the water up to their neck. Yeah, climbing. Yeah. Okay, climbing down yeah. a ladder into the because this is done outdoors. What yeah. a fun study to do. My my yeah. graduate thesis was done uh, under fluorescent lights with no windows in a <laughs> in a building that uh, I mean I had a ton of fun as a PhD student. I actually yeah. lived in the laboratory as a PhD student. I loved it so much, but um, not something required to do a PhD by the way. But um, 
they're climbing down the ladder, yeah, getting in up to their neck, staying in for one to two minutes, and then getting out. And how many times a week are they doing this? So they do this two to three times per week. And for each time they go, each day they go, uh, they take three rounds uh, of, so three dips and two sauna sessions. So they start in the cold and they end in the cold water. Okay, so it's get in for one to two minutes, then get out and get into the sauna. Yeah. Um, what is the temperature of the sauna? Uh, about 80 degrees Celsius. Okay. Then how long are they in the sauna? So they stayed there uh, for 10 to 15 minutes. So depending on if they went two times per week or three times per week. Okay. And then they get back into the cold for a few minutes, yeah. two minutes. So up to two minutes. Yeah. Okay. Then back right. into the sauna. 15 minutes or so, yeah. then back into the cold for a third round, yeah. back into the sauna, and then then they're ending on the and cold. And then back into the cold again, yeah. and then ending on cold. Yeah. And uh, and we will talk about why it's important to yeah. end on cold, the so-called Soberg <laughs> principle. Um, how cold was the water in this particular, uh, given average, because I realize it's outdoor winter swimming, so it's going to vary depending on wind chill and things of as course, well. Of course. So... It's a very uncontrolled environment to do this kind of study in, but I wanted to do something that was also very close to something people could do for free, going out in nature and use that and also have the nature like it's a very healthy impact on us. It lowers our stress uh, stress level uh, as well. So by doing so, I also measured the temperature every time they went. So I have this graph and it's actually in the winter swimming book. It shows the temperature in Denmark going like from October to April, and it's like starts at 12 degrees. Uh, I think it's around 12, de 12 degrees uh, Celsius in um, the water, and then it goes down to two degrees in on average in January, and then up again. Um, so it's within the spectrum of very cold water. I would say from around 15 15 degrees Celsius and, and down, but it was actually not colder than like two to four degrees in in on average when it, it was the coldest. So it doesn't have to be that cold to be good enough and, and enough to activate our metabolism. Um, and what time of day are um, the participants doing this cold sauna alternation? So I think they did this uh, throughout the day. So I didn't control whether they wanted to go in the morning, in the afternoon or, or in the evening. At that time where I set up this study, I, w I was not controlling it in that way. I wanted them to go whenever they had time. And I also think that is the most important message to give out, to give to people is when do it when you have time. It's not if, if, if doing it uh, when you get home from work and it's six o'clock in the evening and this is the time where you are, uh, where you can do it, then, then, then try out if it's going to impact your sleep or not. Uh, if it doesn't impact your sleep, then fine. But you have to try for yourself and find out what works for you. It's the same for coffee, for example, right? Some people can drink coffee in the evening and go to bed and they can sleep. Uh, I can't. <laughs> or exercise. Or exercise, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I can't, I can't do that. And that's because the coffee, exercise, cold water, um, immersion, it's going to activate your uh, sympathetic nervous system. You have an increase in stress response in your body, and, and that's going to make it really hard to fall asleep, for some people at least. Uh, maybe you are super exhausted anyways, and then you will just crash <laughs> mm -hmm. anyways. But yeah, but um, that's, that's the only thing. So I just told them to do this if they can during the daytime. Um, and that's primarily what they also did. Mm -hmm. And then uh, all along, you're measuring brown fat by way of this infrared uh, camera, right? Um, so what did you observe in terms of changes in brown fat? How quickly did that occur? And, um, and then I'd like to ask also about sauna a bit more, um, because earlier you mentioned that you can activate brown fat with sauna as well, with heat on, oh, with on the heat, surface, yeah. uh, surface of the skin. Um, how long did it take before you observed significant increases in brown fat? Um, and was it increased density of my brown fat or distribution? Was it, you know, showing expansion to different regions throughout the body? And um, maybe you could also touch on some of the changes in insulin sensitivity and metabolism. Yeah, a very good, good question. And, and, and I didn't mention this b before, but besides measuring um, uh, temperature uh, as an outcome for brown fat activity, we also 
uh, did PET MRI scanning uh, of the brown fat. So this is like the, the golden standard uh, for measuring brown fat. And it's not very feasible for normal people to get an, an, a PET a CT or PET MRI a scanning of the brown fat. It's super expensive. Um, so we had both uh, to see if we could have like a continuous measure of brown fat in humans because that was already not, not out there. So I wanted to see during both the experimental days, but also during day and night, what kind of like circadian uh, rhythm do we have in our brown fat activity? So that's why I wanted to have that as well. So the PET-CT scanning uh, or the PET-MRI scanning was to see upon code activation um, stimulation for some hours. Do we have activation? Can we see the brown fat in this subject? And also during thermal neutrality or thermal comfortable state, Uh, how is that activated in each of the group, of course. Ah, so you want to see how comfortable people were away from the cold water and sauna just at different um, temperature environments. Is that right? Yeah, so I also measured that. How comfortable are you? I had, I made this scale, like visual analog scale, and asked them, how comfortable do you feel with this temperature? Um, and throughout the study days during cold exposure and thermal comfortable day, I had a whole day where I just kept them uh, thermal comfortable to see do they activate the brown fat if they're just completely thermal comfortable, as good as we could get with that, mm -hmm. because we were asking people... Um, on a scale from one, one to 10 and five being thermal comfortable, where are you on this scale? So one would be very cold and 10 would be super burning hot. Um, yeah, and so that was a way to like uh, try to figure out how do they actually feel uh, also during the studies. I also measured uh, in electromyography uh, so of, of muscles to see do they shiver during the cooling day. Uh, sometimes people shiver before they know they're really shivering. So. I had oh, this, interesting. Yeah. So, so, so our conscious perception of shivering might not be the best readout of shiver. Yeah, well, you, if you also get adapted to the cold water, uh, you will have uh, less shivering. They will be less vigorous. They will be very small. So you wouldn't probably know that you are shivering because it's, the shivering is so small and the mitochondria in the muscle cells will be so dense that it doesn't need to shiver maybe that much to get uh, that uh, thermogenesis going um, compared to when you're completely new uh, to cold uh, water exposure and you're not adapted, then the body needs to create these mitochondria, these energy fabrics to keep you, you warm. And that's also what the exercise is in the beginning. But um, when we measured this, we, we did see that the winter swimmers were shivering less Uh, or uh, having less uh, vigorous shivering when they said I'm cold. So even though they they mm -hmm. perception their perception of the cold was pretty similar in in, in the in the groups, um, we could see that the the activation of the the muscles that we measured on um, were different and more vigorous in the control group. Were the subjects incentivized to be in the study? Were they paid or anything of that sort? Or they just happened to like doing uh, cold and sauna? Uh, <laughs> and so that's why they did the study. Um, well, they got paid a little bit uh, for it, but not much. And mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's how we do this. Study. Sure. So I was just curious. Yeah. Yeah. I was just curious. Yeah. There might be some folks that wonder. So, yeah, so what fine. did you discover in terms of changes in brown fat, insulin resistance, or insulin sensitivity rather, and um, metabolism? So what we, we saw uh, was we had these kind of different measures uh, to see what to try and unravel what, what's actually going on when they are already adapted to the cold water compared to a control group who was uh, matched uh, on, on various parameters. We, we did see that the winter swimmers had an increased insulin sensitivity. They produced less insulin uh, on all the experimental days. So... Besides from just cooling them and measuring the brown fat on each of these cooling days, there were two cooling days and one thermal comfortable day, right? So I wanted to measure insulin when they were just they were fasting, meaning that they hadn't eaten in uh, eight hours before the study day, um, and they were completely laying still, not moving, just in a bed. Um, and we measured insulin uh, during the experimental day just to see how what level are they on? And we could see that the, the, the winter swimmer had lower production of insulin. And they also, when they had an 
glucose drink. So we give them that to see if they, to test before we enroll them in studies to see if they have diabetes, for example, and not knowing, for example, that that wouldn't, that would like ruin maybe the, the study. So we test for that and see if they have like a normal curve. So what we did see in that was that the winter swimmers had a faster glucose clearance in the bloodstream. So after two hours, uh, we could see that they had a lower level and it went, the curve went down faster than in the control group. So, so despite having lower insulin release, they have better blood glucose clearance, which yeah. is really what you want, what yeah, we all seek, yeah. right? You know, yeah. excessive insulin is bad. Insulin being a, um, more or less a chaperone for blood glucose, um, um, can do all sorts of other things as well, of course, but, um, and having high blood glucose, obviously terrible. Yeah. for cells, especially brain cells. I don't think people realize how toxic high blood uh, glucose is. Having for, high for glucose is for brain. If you, if you want to kill neurons, you make you make their uh, sh- put them in an environment where there's too much sugar. Ah. Um, okay. Oh yeah, very yeah, good. very neurotoxic. I mean, that's and there are mechanisms like insulin that buffer that. We keep you know keeping blood glucose in a reasonable range so that um, that doesn't happen. I mean, I think that's why people will go into insulinemic shock. Mm. Um, hypoglycemic shock is also possible. So that range in which neurons are happy mm. is not a bit, it's not a tremendously large range. Incidentally, the range in which neurons are, are, um, happy and surviving, uh, is much greater as one gets colder than when you heat up. I mean, you, you can basically destroy brain cells by getting too hot for too long. Oh yeah. Yeah. You can definitely destroy brain cells permanently by getting too cold for too long, but it, you have to get really, really cold for a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Very uh, interesting. Y- yeah. We're, we're thinking about doing uh, an episode on um, uh, sort of survival of the brain after death kind of things, which actually happens. You know, you hear about these people who are declared dead and then yeah. come back. Oh, and yeah. there's actually now a lot of cryopreservation type approaches for that. Okay. This is, uh, anyway, we, we uh, risk going into the, the, uh, the esoteric now, so I'll steer us back to our discussion about your study. But um, so if I do the math, these subjects are in the cold. Let's say they're doing three rounds of cold for one to two minutes, three t- two or three times a week. What were the thresholds that you discovered were important for getting these positive changes in um, such as reduced blood sugar or clearance of blood sugar? Um, being more efficient, uh, reduced insulin, um, improved brown fat distribution and density. Um, how much cold exposure do people need? How much heat exposure do people need in order to extract these benefits? Yeah. So when we then calculated the numbers together, we could see that this was ended up being 11 minutes uh, in total per week. Uh, so not in one session, of course, but they had two to three visits to the water and the sauna per week. So when we divide that out, it corresponds to being in the cold water one to two minutes at a time, but also in the sauna 10 to 15 minutes at a time. And I think this is very like um, also similar to what we see in other studies when we look, for example, to the observational studies uh, from the Finnish uh, cohort study from uh, uh, Lauken et al., for example, they published this very amazing paper in 2015, um, some results from this long cohort study where they show that... Um, that up to 30 minutes uh, in the sauna was uh, healthy and they you you lower your risk of cardiovascular disease. And that's like the threshold. And if you go further than that, then there is not more uh, um, healthy benefits to, to gain from that. So, um, and before that, it's like 19 minutes, then you will have this dose response relationship up to 19 minutes. That's really in decreasing your risk of cardiovascular diseases. And I think we that's really per look, week, ninety minutes per week. Uh, ninety minutes per session now. Per session, yeah, per okay. session. If we um, uh, then compare that with my study, which was ten to fifteen minutes per session, then I think it fits very well with what we call the hormetic stress or healthy stress that so you expose the cells to this kind of like potent, very uh, stressful situation uh, where they uh, increase heat shock proteins in the cells and that will repair the cells. But if you then overdo it and you go beyond the maybe 30 minutes in the sauna, this observational study from uh, Finland with more than uh, up to 2,000 sauna bathers where they have followed these for 20 years, they see that 
uh, 30 minutes per session is like enough. And if you go above that, you don't get more health benefits out of it. So I think there's a window where we can say the healthy stress corresponds to like 10 minutes. And, and I think it's like- Per session. Per session. Okay. And it's not, it's not much actually. So you don't need to, it shows that you don't have to expose yourself very much to the heat or very much actually to the cold to get this healthy uh, benefits uh, from uh, going into cold, going to heat and have healthy benefits on your cardiovascular system. So I think this is a very important also message to, to, to get out that you don't have to go extreme. You don't have to uh, swim for a, a half an hour in the cold water. You can go in the water for one to two minutes um, per session, but go up to 11 minutes per week in total. And for the sauna, my study showed uh, 57 minutes in total per week. And if we also then divide it out on these two to three days and two sessions each day correspond to 10 to 15 minutes. So it's a low threshold, but I think it's it's good to have that to maybe we can aim for that if, if people need to have something to to aim for. And I think and I think it's really good to have that because then you you don't have then you don't overdo it. And if you overdo it, you exhaust the cells and that will increase your risk of cardiovascular disease also. So, Well, I get a lot of questions about this and I did solicit for questions for this podcast on, on Twitter. And one of the questions that I got was, as one becomes more cold adapted, do the benefits start to wear off or can people do too much cold exposure? And of course, the answer to that is yes, you can become hypothermic, but I'm sensing yeah. a different answer now, which is, if I understand correctly, um, the threshold is 11 minutes total per week of deliberate cold exposure divided into two or three sessions of maybe one to three minutes, depending on yeah. how long somebody stays in. And then 57 minutes, I want to be careful not to round up um, to an hour, but divide it into maybe three 20 minute sessions or so, you know? Um, so one doesn't have to be perfect as long as you get no. beyond that threshold. Exactly. But I, I wonder something, which is, is it the case that if somebody said, oh, you know, I'm just going to do one 11 minute session per week, that might actually not be as beneficial as dividing it up because what you told us earlier is that the hormetic response depends on having that cold shock. You actually don't want to become too cold adapted. I mean, once the blood pressure response drops down, so in minute four, five, and six, yeah. you're getting very cold and you're shivering, but your one is not getting the autonomic stimulus that they want. I guess I could liken this to um, if exercise worked in a way where it was only the first few minutes of exercise that really mm -hmm. triggered the adaptation. Of course, this is not how it works, but um, in fact, probably quite the opposite. Um, but if that were the case, then it's not simply the total amount of exercise, but dividing up the 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 sessions into little bouts where every single time it acts as a, as a stimulus. Yes. That seems to be the key here. Yes. Um, this is very important, um, because having watched the landscape of this on social media, but also in books and generally, um, I think you're the first person to really touch on this, that the goal is not to get so cold adapted that you can sit in for the full 11 minutes in one session where the goal isn't to be able to do an hour of very hot sauna. If you want to, I suppose people could do it for other reasons, but if the yeah. goal is to improve these health metrics, yeah. then the idea is to keep the stimulus a stimulus. Short, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, this also, I think there's practical feasibility, as you pointed out, because getting into a cold shower or cold immersion or natural body water for a couple of minutes is far less, uh, um, you know, challenging to most people than finding a full morning to go, you know, spend yeah. there. Um, but I've never really heard it articulated that the longer sessions might not be beneficial and might actually be detrimental. Um, that's very important. Uh, were there any other observations that you made um, that did not make it into the paper or that were kind of in the, the margin notes um, in terms of psychological benefits um, it, or anything of that sort? There was this recent study on soldiers that talked about weight loss. It's sort of a controversial study um, for a lot of reasons. Um, but one of the things they remarked uh, in the paper was that there were a lot of psychological changes, improved buffering against anxiety. Um, they even, the men and women in that study 
um, reported one of the significant effects was um, significantly improved sexual satisfaction. Of course, they didn't tell us what that meant for these subjects, but <laughs> so we won't go there. But but a number of subjective improvements. Was there anything that you observed or took note of in, in your study that perhaps didn't make the main abstract, but that we should be aware of? Uh, yeah, there were some. Um, and I'm I'm today, I regret that I didn't measure on sleep, for example. I uh, I frankly didn't really think about that when I I uh, when I designed the study. Um, so we were very um, much uh, occupied with the metabolism, and kind of had the thought maybe this could impact uh, sleep quality. Um, and I wish I just if I had the thought that why don't you just ask them in a questionnaire? But I asked them every morning or every morning it was not many mornings, but just two mornings, actually, uh, we measured on. Um, but the winter swimmers um, told us before I wrote them that they had a really good uh, sleep quality. The control group also had that, but they told me on the day where we measured uh, brown fat on uh, on a day and a night, uh, so uh, for actually two days and two nights, um, they told me that they didn't. They had a good night's sleep, but they also woke up. So it's just telling me that they also had like a quick wake up and then they fell asleep again. Um, and the winter swimmers uh, told they have a really good sleep. So it's like, and in general, they also say we, we sleep very well. I sleep very well. So it's anecdotally in general, it corresponds to what I heard in my study, but nothing that I measured on, um, which would could be fun to do in the future, but we didn't measure uh, on sleep quality. That would be, have been a really good idea to do. They also told me that they were very comfortable uh, when they were cold. They they don't mind uh, winter swimmers. They don't mind um, going out, for example, um, in in the cold with a t shirt. They were also less uh, scared of showing their skin. That was yeah. also one observation. Ooh, interesting. Uh, yeah. So kind of a reduced social anxiety. Yeah, they were just yeah. so comfortable in the lab. You, mm -hmm. as you just mentioned before coats on and everybody's running around. It was very busy and um, all the other um, scientists out in the hallway and uh, also my supervisor had her office down down the hallway and, and one of the winter swimmers one day just got out of bed after I uh, had been in the study for uh, eight hours. We, it was a long day, right? He jumped out of the bed and had his clothes in the bathroom and he went out completely naked he didn't care. He just went out. It was like, oh. Was Wait, like, so that's a side effect, perhaps, of getting too comfortable <laughs> yeah. with the cold. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we're not recommending that. No. Although in your book, you um, did a, uh, you dedicated some, uh, let me start that again. Although in your book, you dedicated some uh, pages to um, naked winter swimming, or oh, I should say naked cold water exposure, yeah. as opposed to um, uh, with bathing suit. Yeah. Uh, are there any data on this? I'm sorry, chuckling, but um, <laughs> I think in most places in the United States, it's uh, skinny dipping is not um, is not legal. Uh, most public beaches. There are a few. In fact, where I, I my laboratory before moving to Stanford was in San Diego, and I at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, beautiful building, incredible science is done there. The beach right below that is called Black's Beach. Okay. And um, and it's a known nude beach. Um, and so whenever tourists were heading down the, the stairway there, um, I would, you know, sort of let them know, especially if they had kids, I'd let oh, them know, you know, it's a, and it's a nude beach of a particular, um, uh, of a particular genre. So I, I'd give them a little warning about what, what they could expect down below. It's a, um, in any event, those, those beaches are quite rare, um, in the United States, maybe compared to Europe. I don't know. Um, but yeah, maybe. Yeah. So is there anything special about, um, clothless versus clothed, um, exposure? Yeah, I think in, in that sense, uh, we are a bit more free with this kind of like, but, but remember, we also had this winter swimming culture for so, for hundreds of years in Denmark. Mm -hmm. And the winter, the oldest winter swimming clubs that we have, especially the one we have in Copenhagen, where I did my next study, which we haven't talked about, but, and it's also not pub published yet, but um, in that winter swimming club, it's the oldest one we have, and it's huge. And they, they swim naked at, uh, this uh, facility men and women men and women and they have sauna where they can go in together mm -hmm. and they also have the separate saunas but it's very much a, a danish thing and and i think it's i think it's, it's i think it's good if people want that mm -hmm. um and i had it in my book because 
people want to know if they have to swim with their bathing suit on or if they can take it off or what's the what's the difference is there any difference in this and if you ask me there is no difference of if you have your little skinny bikini on it's not going to do any difference to your uh, cold exposure or your adaptation it's not going to do any difference for your benefits of course but I think that it has something else. It has something to do with how you also observe yourself, how you observe your, your surroundings. And it's some, some sense of freedom in skinny dipping. So I think people in Denmark who does this, is they do the winter swimming because they feel free when they do it. They come home from work, they go to this club and they skinny dip and they feel like in touch with nature. And they have maybe done this their whole life. So this is an old tradition in Denmark in some of the clubs. Um, but the newer clubs that are coming, they don't they do not do skinny dip. So it, everyone has bathing suit. I never skinny dip because there are people around, people with phones and taking pictures right. all the time. So this is so different, this, different nowadays. Everything's different, recorded. Yeah. yeah. And also this, this old tradition is also fading away because of that. Yeah. I, um, I, use sauna and cold at home, but when I travel there, there's a, a banya. So Russian banya has hot sauna and cold plunge. Um, there's one in San Francisco called Archimedes banya. Um, and that one is clothing optional. And so some people are clothed such as myself and then other people are not. And it's co-ed most of the time. I think they have male, a female separated, uh, evenings or something like that. And then, um, the other banya is spa 88, which is in, on wall street in New York is an amazing banya as well. Um, and these are starting to crop up in different cities, or maybe they've been there for a long time. And as deliberate cold exposure and sauna gets more popular, more people are using them. The the one in New York that I that uh, Spa eighty eight is always clothed, um, and it's interesting because you know people hear uh, naked or skinny dipping, and they they might get certain ideas in mind. It um, yeah, all these places are very well lit, and they all have a tone of kind of um, of health that is about the kind of health and 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 wellness. Um, I guess the point being that um, there's no requirement uh, to do one thing or the other. Um, although in the studies that uh, you did, obviously um, people were clothed, but I, I did um, I did pay attention to those pages in your book. I thought yeah. it was interesting <laughs> that you put some um, some dedicated uh, passages in your book related to this. And I think it, my publisher wanted that. Oh, your like, publisher yeah, wanted that. Yeah, interesting. It, it was not me. It was like my publisher really wanted to have a little discussion about that. So yeah. I was like, okay. <laughs> well, I think it you know it points to a larger theme, which is I think for a lot of people who already do these practices, um, there's no shock there. Yeah. Um, for people that do not do deliberate cold exposure or sauna, I think that. Um, you know, there is this idea perhaps that, oh, you know, these are um, traditions that are are kind of fringe or that they're kind of, and I just, I want to um, cue that point because there's so many things that are happening right now in biomedical research and medicine, you know, serious quality peer-reviewed studies published in excellent journals like your paper on things like deliberate cold exposure, sauna, um, the use of particular supplements, natural natural herbs and supplements. I mean, there's an entire branch of the National Institutes of Health in the United States dedicated just to the study of supplements and behavioral interventions for health, like meditation and breath work. Really incredible. incredible. It's really incredible. And psychedelics, of course, being something that for a long time was part of a certain community and feel, and now is being, um, frankly, adopted by mainstream med medicine, even pharma. So it, the, the times are changing. Um, and so, uh, Yes, I think it's important to know that um, it's perfectly acceptable and encouraged to wear clothing. So. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and one other thing that uh, I wanted to to mention, going back to your questions around if there were any observations in the studies which we really maybe haven't discussed yet, and maybe it's in in the back of the the paper and not mentioned that much, was one of the winter swimmers didn't have any brown fat when we measured him. Zero. Zero. And uh, in, we do see this um, in, in, in previous studies as well, that some humans don't have any brown fat. Was he, did he carry a lot of white fat adipose tissue? Was, no. he, was he obese? No, he wasn't. No, he was not obese because that he would not have been in the study then. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, right. Yeah. Yes, you yeah. mentioned this earlier. Yeah. Forgive me. Uh, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> but he was, um, but what I did observe before I knew that he didn't have any brown fat was that during the cooling experiment where I cooled them for uh, two hours before they go into the PET-CT scanner, uh, he 
was not able to control his uh, shivering like the winter swimmers uh, could. So he got he got very uh, cold very easily uh, compared to the others. So and without I didn't know what was different about him, but we could t- all all our me and the three others were working on the experiment. We were like, okay, what's going on? Because we turned down the, the temperature, but he started like shivering and then we had to turn it up again. And it was just all over the place, the temperature. It's not, it wasn't that controlled like the others. It was pretty similar protocol. I could just do pretty much the same because they were same size and uh, also same gender. <laughs> so it, it, it was easier uh, to like foresee what was going to happen and when will they start shiver. I quickly learned that. But with this subject, it was just, with this uh, volunteer, it was just very much different. And then when we scanned him and didn't find any brown fat, I, I, I didn't even think about it. So when we scanned him, we didn't see anything. I told the pet CT people to like, oh, you put up the wrong uh, scanning. Right, it blame was, the technology. Yeah, it, the right. technology. It was like, this scanning looked like the thermoneutral day, the thermocomfortable day, where we also scanned them to see if they have any brown fat. So you have made a mistake. I was pretty sure... And they reanalyzed reanal- uh, anal- this um, scanning and they just concluded, well, it, the scanning was fine. The experiment went well. It was just that he didn't have any brown fat. Hmm. So he was like what we just in the paper called a, a brown fat negative. So he didn't have any. And in, in my studies, it, it would be called a knockout. So he mm-hmm. didn't have any brown fat. So what the observation with him, and I think that would be, that's interesting, is that he both shivered very early on and didn't regulate his temperature as well. He also told me that then he was like a five on the scale of how comfortable he felt with the cold. Um, and Out of. So it was from one to 10 mm-hmm. and five being thermal comfortable mm-hmm. and 10 being uh, very uh, cold uh, and, and one very hot. So on this like scale up and up and down. And he he was like more up and down on this scale than any of the others. It was an observation that I did. Um, But we did see in his blood samples also that his blood samples looked a bit more like the control group. Um, Also, his uh, insulin levels were like the control group, so a little bit higher than the other winter swimmers. And he also had um, his blood glucose clearance was not as uh, fast as... um, as the, the the other winter swimmers. So he was like an outlier, what we call it. And in the analysis, we also had to take him out uh, of the analysis because he was an outlier. Um, so the results showing that the brown fat uh, is uh, more efficiently activated in the winter swimmers is without him having in, him in that group. Got but it. it didn't ruin the, the study. If we, I tried to put him in, in as well, and didn't it didn't ruin the, the results or anything. But just to to keep it more clear, we put we took him out of the analysis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he was a mutant, a knockout. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure they're out there. Um, very interesting. So if you shiver early. Um, then perhaps you have less brown fat to begin with. Although it's hard to conclude from one person. That's sort of the the, the implication there. Or uh, you haven't adapted to the code. So you right. should build that up. Right. Yeah. Right. So in addition to looking at regulation of blood sugar, brown fat, metabolism, and so on, were there any markers that you examined in the deliberate cold exposure group as compared to controls? Um, that revealed to you that deliberate cold exposure could have additional benefits, um, say for uh, immune system function um, or for any function for that matter? Yeah, so for um, we looked at inf- inflammation, of course, we measure o- the outcome of blood pressure and so on, but we also measured the IL-6 in the study just to see also an inflammatory and inflammatory marker. So IL-6 went up and it also follows with the IL-10. So that is like also very known in the literature. So we measured that. And I think it's very important to to think about the cold exposure and the heat exposure as something that then lowers the inflammation in the body. And would, if we can do that we will have an open door for um, uh, preventing lifestyle diseases, right? So for um, type 2 diabetes, but actually also for some mental uh, diseases as well, so as known as depression and anxiety and also Alzheimer's disease, which are all associated um, in uh, research, also newer research showing that 
uh, at, that inflammation increases the risk of depression, anxiety, and Alzheimer's disease, neurological diseases. So if we can decrease inflammation in the body, we will decrease our modern lifestyle diseases, but also these increasing uh, um, uh, mental diseases that we see in these modern lifestyle times. Um, so I think that it's, I think it's very interesting that we can go out in nature and we can use these natural stressors. And it, it, I don't want to have it sound very romantic or anything. It's just, it's just exposure to temperature, actually, just to cold or to heat. That is going to twerk our body into a natural state again and, and reset it where the, the, the homeostasis, the balance, has, is lost a bit. So the body is going to repair itself in that way. And I think it's beautiful that we can do that just by changing the temperature of our body. And although people are very scared of doing this, because in our times, we have been away from cold, away from heat, temperature uh, for some for decades now, um, since uh, we isolated our houses better and uh, we are more sedentary, we also sit more indoor, we don't move as much. So this very um, modern sedentary lifestyle has made us more temperature comfortable, just neutral. So no, no wonder, I mean, that obesity is increasing. We don't expose ourselves to the natural stresses that we did earlier on. Um, in, in our involvement, but also up until maybe the 70s, the 60s, where we started having more like uh, comfortable lifestyles, right? And obesity increases in the, in the 80s. We can see that from statistics. So I think that if we can take in cold and heat, and uh, you mentioned other things also before, but of course, exercise is very important here. And also a bit of fasting, actually, because it all increases the hormetic stress in the body. So it's, it doesn't have to be uh, other than natural stresses to the body, which then could keep us in that natural balance again. Could we talk about what I refer to as the Soberg principle, which is to end on cold? And the reason I called it the Soberg principle is because um, in reviewing, oh, by the way, I wasn't a official reviewer of your paper, but I mean, in reading and um, reviewing your paper for its after published contents, I noticed that you had people end on cold. And this has been a long standing debate in the, the uh, deliberate cold exposure community. Should you warm up in the, with a warm shower afterwards or get back in the sauna? What should you end on cold or end on heat? And the sober principle says end on cold. As I understand it, in order to force your body to heat itself back up and thereby increase metabolism further still. Is that right? Yes. So. When you, when you end on the cold, you, you force your body to heat up by itself. And that will require that you activate, you keep your brown fat activated and also your muscles, which is a good thing. It's a good collaboration to keep your thermogenesis up. And that's like an, an exercise, even when you go home. So in that way, you don't have to think about your cold exposure, dipping in, in your plunge, uh, or open sea or what it is, as just... A, an exercise that you do for one to two minutes and then it's over. If you uh, end on the cold, you have an exercise for your body going on for hours afterwards. And that's not only on your metabolism, but it's also going to keep your neurotransmitters uh, activated as well and increase that because your body is still cold. So you need that uh, uh, those neurotransmitters to activate the brown fat as well. So that's going to make your brown fat cells more efficient and also your muscle cells more efficient. So increasing mitochondria in the cells which will then generate heat very fast. So if you have done this for a few times, so maybe three, four, five times, um, being new to this, but have tried it a few times, you will notice a switch where you like feel that you get easily warmer and you can keep yourself warmer. And that is also what was shown in, in my study is that the, the winter swimmers were physically uh, warmer on the skin compared to the control group. So they, they when they are out of the cold. When they're out of the cold, just yeah. relaxing. And we tested this in in on the days where they were sleeping in the lab. So we could see that they had a, a more activation of the brown fat, a higher temperature. So probably because they also lose heat. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a higher heat loss to the body uh, compared to the control group um, because they have a more vascular uh, skin uh, because of the contrast of cold and heat. So they lose heat faster from the body during the day. But is that a bad thing? 
No, probably not, because that's going to keep your brown fat and your muscles a little bit activated. So you will have to, it, it has to work to keep you warm. I, and I would hypothesize that it also might lead to some of the um, subjectively reported improvements in sleep, because in order to fall asleep, you need your core body temperature to drop by about one to three degrees. Yes. So it's not just sufficient to be sleeping in a cold room and under the blanket. You also need your body temperature to drop. Yes. And so what you're um, saying, if I understand correctly, is that by forcing, by ending on cold and forcing oneself to heat up naturally, um, that increases the brown fat stores, which I sort of see as a kind of like the oil in the candle yeah. uh, of the furnace that is thermogenesis. And that in turn leads to increased heat loss, which people might think, oh, I don't want to lose heat from the body. But you, there are times when you want to lose yeah. heat from the body. Basically, it sounds like what we want is to be a very efficient heating and cooling system. Yes. That it's not about being cold or being hot. It's really about keeping the system tuned well, keeping the oil in the candle, this brown fat um, functioning. Yeah. What, could I ask one question about um, fed or fasted? Is there any... Or, Rather, are there any known benefits of doing deliberate cold exposure and or sauna fasted uh, versus um, after a, a meal, say within the last hour or something of that sort? I do my deliberate mm -hmm. cold exposure first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, so in general, I'm fasted because I don't eat until a little bit later in the day. Yeah. Uh, but what's known about that? And was that looked at in your study? I know you measured glucose, but that was as a separate um, test away yeah. from the cold. Away from the cold, yeah. But I also tested glucose on the days on the cold. So mm. we measured that as well on, on the cooling days. Um, specifically on fasting and fat, I don't know. Uh, I don't think that I have seen studies specifically on this. Okay. Um, more science needed. Mm -hmm. um, a number of people ask about the use of deliberate cold exposure to offset some of the symptoms of various diseases. Now here, we're not talking about curing disease, we're talking about offsetting symptoms. Um, one question I've seen quite often is whether or not people with Raynaud's syndrome, this is a syndrome, and my high school girlfriend had this syndrome, and I'll never forget, uh, we went, we were at a, a school dance together, and um, this was when we first started dating, and um, she had Raynaud's, which uh, leads to very poor blood flow to the the uh, the extremities, and, um, and she was very cold, so she left to go to the bathroom and warm up her hands in the warm water. And I was left standing there at the dance and people came up to me and asked, you know, why I was there and who I was there with. And I kept telling them who I was with and they didn't believe me because they couldn't believe that she would be with me. <laughs> Made total sense if you knew me at the time. Um, I, was, I, I was way out of my league with her um, at the time. I like to think eventually I caught up, but in any case, um, uh, she was in the bathroom for about an hour. So at one point I did consider the possibility that she had just left. But indeed she hadn't. She warmed her hands back up. But people with Raynaud's suffer from this um, from this thing of very, very cold uh, extremities. The, um, their fingertips will even turn blue, um, you know, as if they were starting to get frostbitten. It's quite dramatic. Um, and that question gets asked whether or not there's any use of cold to try and increase the um, elasticity, the plasticity of the, of the uh, small capillaries and vessels. Um, by everything you've described um, up until now, it seems like that would be a logical thing to do. Um, and in addition to that, whether or not people with autoimmune conditions, people with um, any other types of conditions are known to benefit from deliberate cold exposure. I'm not aware of any studies, but I get asked about this a lot. And there were a lot of questions about this for you in the, in the Twitter feed. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for those questions. Yeah. And I get them as well on social media. And I have to say that I, I haven't seen any studies directed uh, on this outcome on measuring Raynaud's uh, syndrome. Um, I do know that it's it's uh, it's not that rare actually a problem, and I know that many women or more mem women than men uh, suffer from this. Um, but logically, it would help them if they expose their hands to cold and also heat to make the vas it more vascular, but. And I have heard from people saying that it had helped them, but also heard from some others saying it didn't help them. Mm -hmm. So studies are needed on this specific topic, I think. Mm -hmm. I hurt my hands when I go into the cold. And I don't have this syndrome at all, uh, but I keep my hands above the water. You do? Yeah. And ah. I, I do that. Um, often I take a little bit of a swim. And then, of course, I have to have my hands in the water. 
Uh, but it helps me when I then get back to the, the daddy um, and then take my hands up because then I can stand there for a little bit and get my one to two minutes exposure uh, and then I can go up because then otherwise that would stop me from uh, being in the water enough time that I, as long as I, I would like to. So if people suffer from having this pain in the fingers and it, it can be very intense. Mm -hmm. So just take the hands up a bit from the water and uh, and that's going to help you. Also boots, neoprene boots, it's going to help on the feet. Some people have the hurt, um, feel the pain in the feet and or in the ankles, and that's going to help them also a little bit. Okay, so there is no problem with keeping hands out or feet in uh, neoprene booties if people feel the need to do that. If that's no, what the, if no. pain of the hands or feet is a barrier for people doing uh, deliberate cold exposure, then it seems it would be okay to do, uh, to keep hands out or to keep your feet in Yes, booties. because yeah. then you, you do get the exposure. Uh, but of course, hands and feet are very potent uh, places in your body to get a fast uh, activation uh, of your nervous system, of course. But if you can just, you can also just dip them and then take them up. It's gonna, still going to activate that. But you have your full body is covered in, in uh, cope receptors. You'll have a full activation anyways. So You're, yeah. <laughs> you are providing very reassuring information to people because I know a number of people that do not like to put their hands in. I find that the more of my body I get in, the more comfortable I am. Psycho I don't know if it's psychologically and or physiologically. I find that if where there's an interface between the water and the cold, it's most uncomfortable. So I prefer to just get everything under. I keep my head out. Although I, these days I've been dunking all the way in and then coming out and then dunking once more with my head under before I get out after the, the plunge. Um, that raises a different question. Now we're getting into kind of the practicalities of deliberate cold exposure, which I think are, are important. Um, sometimes I'll experience, and I hear from a lot of people that they'll get a kind of back of the head headache at the interface of the, of the water, um, you know, when they're in doing cold immersion to the neck. Um, okay. I assume this has to do with blood flow, that there's vasoconstriction right up until the neck and in the region surrounding it, but that maybe there's still blood flow to the head. But do we know what the origin of these um, headaches is? And again, this doesn't happen for everybody, but some people do experience them. Okay. Yeah. I haven't really heard about that one specifically. Um, so, but I would say that there are different reasons for maybe keeping your head out of the water, but it seems like maybe for some that could be a reason for like just getting like a quick head dunk. Going to, all the way in yeah, once. Yeah. That's what I've started doing to yeah. eliminate. I, I wasn't getting headaches, but I could, yeah. I noticed that interface okay. and, I, and I wasn't in the rest of the experience it so much, uh, okay. experience of it so much. So I started dunking all the way in. Uh -huh. I noticed in some of the photos that you've put out um, and in your book that you'll sometimes wear a, a cap yeah. while you go in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And well, it comes from uh, different reasons. Uh, so let's talk about some of the physiological reasons. So when you submerge in, in cold water up to the neck, um, studies have shown, and this is from Denmark, studies from uh, Bispebjerg Hospital, um, that uh, when you submerge into cold water up to the neck at zero degrees, uh, so zero degrees Celsius, very cold, um, you will have a decreased blood flow to the brain by around 30 to 40%. And it makes sense because you activate the sympathetic nervous system uh, and, and therefore you will have a less blood flow to the brain. It makes you maybe a little bit dizzy. Or, and, Proof and, again that you're, <laughs> you need a heart more than a brain because it, <laughs> when the sympathetic nervous system gets activated, uh, blood flow is maintained to the heart to keep you alive, but obviously taken away from the brain to keep you from thinking. That's why it's hard to think when you're stressed. Yeah, well, the muscles and, and, and your vital organs need to, you have to be able to run away from right. that tiger, right? Oh, I, it's like, the, <laughs> the, the rationale makes total sense. And yeah. who am I to disagree with Mother Nature? Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, but yeah, so one of the reasons being that you should keep your head out of the water is that you could increase that uh, decrease in blood flow to the brain further if you dunk the head. Mm -hmm. So there's this a very nice paper from, um, from a, a, a research group in Canada where they have collectively uh, looked at different papers where they uh, compared heat loss in a group in the papers where they dunked the head and compared to heat loss uh, submerging up to the neck to see how much extra heat do we lose from our core when we dunk the head. So, uh, and I think it's very interesting that if you submerge up to the neck, you have a heat loss of 11% from the body core. And when you then uh, also dunk the head, you will increase that 
heat loss rate by 36 percent. So that means I'm not saying that I'm not I'm not here to say what is right and what is wrong. I just think that people should know the information so they can for themselves evaluate what is best for them. But if you increase your heat loss rate by 36 percent from your core, that's going to increase your after drop, which we touched upon a little bit earlier, uh, even further. So that's meaning that you are closer to hypothermia than you are if you just submerge up to the neck. So you should really think about whether this is like something that uh, you want to do or if it's just better for you not to get that cold in your core. The beanie is also because I have a little bit of sensitive ears. So it meaning that if there's wind, and because we swim in the open sea in Denmark, we have a lot of wind. Our wind, our conditions are just very rainy, very windy, and when the temperature is also freezing, you could get this. Um, what is that called? Um, so very cold and lightheaded just from wind. So if you also submerge into cold water and you then get up, you could you would get a brain freeze immediately. Yeah. So. It is enough to just go up to the neck, wear a beanie to just not get dizzy also because the the um, the heat loss is increased, of course, but it also the blood flow to the brain has decreased. So the beanie will keep you a little bit warmer so you can stay for one to two minutes. So it's just a way of like getting around some of the conditions also. So people can choose that if they, they feel that, but it's quite normal uh, to do in, in Scandinavia, wear a beanie. Love it. And um, so for those of you afraid of doing a two minute cold shower, what uh, Dr. Silver just uh, described, uh, let's, uh, you see how um, she and others are capable of doing things far harder than that. Um, <laughs> when the, the way you describe it with the cold wind in Scandinavia and uh, um, is, is quite striking. It, along the lines of covering the head, um, there's this um, seemingly paradoxical uh, thing of people going into hot saunas and wearing wool caps. You know, if you go to a banya or you uh, go to uh, a sauna and there are people who are, um, well, from Eastern Europe or typically or Finland or um, Russia or uh, Ukraine or elsewhere, what you'll see is that many of them are wearing wool caps in the yeah. sauna, which many people think is to make it hotter. That's actually not the case. It actually insulates you from the heat environment. The, urge, the sense of urgency to get out of the hot sauna is a brain-driven mechanism. And so um, the reason that people wear wool hats in the sauna is it actually lets you stay in the sauna longer um, because it takes a lot of heat to the skin before you feel that you, you have, quote unquote, have to get out. Whereas so when you insulate the brain, um, you don't get that signal. Um, it's pretty interesting. I've tried this before just by putting a towel over my head in the sauna and you can stay in there you know, much more easily and for, for much longer. You know. As we talk about these different stimuli for um, the hormetic response, the adaptation to stress, you know, it occurs to me that the, the big ones uh, in our evolutionary history have been light, right? I mean, you were talking about seasonal changes. Um, we know there, especially as you go up to Nordic countries, there are seasonal changes in the amount of light by time of year, dramatic mm -hmm. ones, in fact, dramatic less, ones. less so at the equator, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, light, temperature, food, movement. It, and it it's sort of interesting. And, and at the same time, perhaps it should have been obvious to us that there are stimuli that our bodies have evolved to adapt to in very powerful ways. It, and so the idea that temperature, heat, and cold could evoke these tremendous physiological changes that are beneficial for us probably shouldn't surprise us no. at all. No. I mean, I mean, this is why we, I mean, th these are not um, so esoteric mechanisms. They're actually the, the foundational mechanisms by which our, our body and the bodies of other animals adapt. Um, so I do have a question about the uh, different ways that people could approach deliberate cold exposure. So for instance, um, children. Uh, I've been to banyas where there are kids, you know, six or seven years old with their parents at the banya. Um, and so they're in hot sauna. I'm not suggesting people do this if they're, if they're not, you know, adapted to it and, you know, Talk to your parents' kids and talk to your kids' parents. Um, talk to your doctors. Um, <laughs> but it is remarkable. I mean, uh, children doing sauna from a young age or deliberate cold exposure. Uh, are there any data on this? And is it safe, assuming that, you know, obviously that they can swim and or they're doing this in a, in a tub or shower? Um, and then I'd also like to ask you about, are there any additional male-female 
differences. I know your study focused um, on men, but um, other studies have focused on both. And you, of course, um, are a woman and can attest to your own experience with this. Um, so children, men, women, um, differences there um, in terms of protocols. Is there anything that people should build into the structure of, of their deliberate cold exposure that's unique to that? Uh, so, yeah, so this was on, on cold exposure. So, um, yeah, I think that um, starting with the, the question about children, um, I think that it's important to to think about it as children are smaller than adults, so we cannot really completely transfer all the information and the benefits and also protocols for how long and, and, and stuff like that to children. We cannot do that because they are just smaller in mass. And one study that actually um, improves this is a study where they have uh, compared uh, heat loss uh, in um, children, uh, boys who were 12 years old, uh, compared to um, adults, um, men, and looked at heat loss of the core temperature and exposed them to uh, a one or one or two minutes um, cold exposure, so immersion up to the neck. And what they saw was that the, the, the boys in this study could actually defend the core temperature in the uh, same way as the adults could, but they had to use their muscles way faster. So it means that they couldn't stay for as long uh, and they use more energy to defend their core temperature compared to the to the adults. But for one minute, it seems that they could actually, um, but they will be colder when they then come out because they are smaller in their mass to their ratio, right? So it means that if the surface is so large on children and their mass and muscles being smaller to that ratio, it means that they can be in the water uh, less time before they get hypothermic. So just think about that. They are just smaller. They can't defend their temperature uh, for a very long time. But in this study, they saw that for up to, I think it, it was a minute or so. They one could, minute. One minute, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned hypothermia and smaller bodied um, people, children. Uh, I used to do some um, Pacific uh, Ocean swims in the morning um, without wetsuits. And I adapted to it pretty quickly. And these are fairly long swims. And we brought an excellent swimmer with us um, so that was interning with me for a while. Um, he's 16 years old at the time and um, very lean. And um, he wasn't small for his age, but he was smaller than us. Yeah. Than the, uh, it was all guys on the swim that day. Um, sometimes women join us. Um, and he got hypothermic. Um, and he's an excellent swimmer. And he didn't report feeling overly cold, but um, fortunately, we got him to shore and heated him up again. Um, so he lived. I don't think his mother is going to ever let him go swimming with us again. He's thriving in the world. He's a university student now. Um, and he recalls that swim. I mean, this is why you always want to ocean swim with a buddy, with people. Yes. Um, yeah, he he became hypothermic. His teeth turned yellow. He was kind of slurring his words. He wasn't making sense you know we got him onto shore and he was kind of you know drooling and a little semi-euphoric yeah. and then kind of you know it was um hypothermia is no joke so it i think no um, joke. yeah so I, I i'm really glad that this is coming up because the cold is a powerful stimulus and um and i and kids are at a and smaller bodied people are at a, a greater risk of hypothermia so a good reason to approach it with caution maybe Very start cautious. with cold showers get uh then cold immersion in still water natural water and open bodies of water of course are always going to be um, more dangerous for other reasons, currents and yeah. things of that sort. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And drowning, uh, yeah. So important note there. Um, what about any additional male-female differences or similarities that um, we should be aware of? And this comes up all the time on social media. Anytime I post anything about a study, yeah. it's, it's what about women? Because oftentimes there are differences. Um, yeah, yeah. And 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 there are, we we also just talked about the difference in, 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 in temperature in men and women. So it means that if we did, if we replicated my study in women, it could be that they would uh, have enough, you can say, cold exposure with just nine minutes per week. It could be because they uh, apparently uh, are also just colder and uh, and they have uh, increased metabolism in their brown fat. It's just they have more brown fat. It could be, but this is just something that I, 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 I frankly don't know. But women also do cold exposure winter swimming with the 11 minutes protocol. I do it myself and feel uh, good about it. So I would say that 
um, women uh, also regarding activation of the brown fat, it should be the same um, in theory, but I don't know if women actually do need to have another protocol when it comes to this rapid cold exposure. I think that it's another question if we are talking about ice swimming when it comes to how far can you be in the cold water without getting hypothermic, then there will be differences uh, in men and, and, and female. But, but if you do this cold exposure for a very brief amount of time, which is what I try to, to talk to ba- talk about, the, what we call also micro-stressing the body to, to increase the hormetic stress, the healthy stress, then this is such a short amount of um, ex- exposure that it, it's fairly the same. I think I think women can look at this as a fairly uh, good protocol for, the, for for them as well. I always say that if you really dread the cold and um, and don't like the cold, then you are a perfect candidate for using deliberate cold exposure because the sympathetic, aka the stress response, will be greater, and thereby the adaptation to that shorter one or two minutes is. Um, is going to be much greater, right? Uh, for people that are perfectly comfortable in the cold, it's harder to get a, an adaptation response. The same way that if somebody's very strong and they can lift a very heavy weight, that that very heavy weight is unlikely to evoke the same kind of, or same degree of yeah. of uh, adaptive responses if somebody is not quite as strong. Yes. So uh, another reason to keep these exposures relatively short yeah. and more frequent than to do longer duration exposures frequently. However, let's say somebody only had two days a week um, to do deliberate cold exposure. Maybe they don't have access to a sauna. Maybe they do. Would you suggest that they get in for one or two minutes, then get out, then get back in for another couple of minutes, then get out and call that for, you know, four or five minutes um, to try and get to that 11 minutes total per week um, as opposed to getting in for a full five minutes um, and then getting out and coming back a second time that week. I know this is getting down into the weeds, but these are the sorts of things that I think people really want to know because a lot of people either don't live close to a body of water or don't have a cold plunge, um, that they can do this with, although cold shower apparently works too. So uh, most people live close to a shower. Yeah, as so definitely, I think the the changes in temperature is what is uh, strengthening your your cells in the body. So if you can do the short amount of uh, exposure and then get out and get back in, that is gonna you can say um, um, strengthen your cells because you are challenging them to to adapt to um, changing tem- temperatures. Mm-hmm. So. During one session, you can change this, right? You you can do it if you are able to go to cold water, but also a sauna. Then you just do it that automatically. You will have a change in temperature. But you could also do it by variating the temperature in your cold plunge. If you have, if you have a plunge, or if you have the open sea, or you have seasoning uh, seasons. Even you have we have that in Denmark, so we have four seasons, and the temperature is going to vary with that. So we have nature who can just change this for us, and we don't have to think about it. But if you have a cold plunge. Well, then I would say that changing the temperature is what is going to create this hormetic stress and also keep your cells on its toes, you can say, because you are try the body will still be um, stressed to try to adapt to the n- new temperature as it's seen as something actually toxic to the body, right? It's a small, small piece of toxicity that you are exposing yourself to. You don't have to swallow it, but it's enough that you mm-hmm. touch it, actually. Yeah, the great. A great way to frame it. Um, that brings me back to this idea of circadian time. In your study, you didn't um, control for a specific time of day. And now I'm realizing that may be a great asset to the whole thing. So we know, for instance, that our bodies go through pretty dramatic shifts in temperature from the time we wake up. Um, our body starts heating up as we wake up and um, continues to heat until the afternoon and then starts to drop in the later afternoon. And then assuming all things are working correctly, um, that body temperature drops and we sleep. So I could imagine that doing deliberate cold exposure at different times, um, just by way of convenience or by way of intention, could be very beneficial because my body temperature is going to be quite a bit warmer at one time of day versus another. And in that way, keeping the system tuned. And that's really what I keep hearing coming through in as you explain these data and all these um, beautiful studies, yours and others, is that it's not really about getting cold. It's about going from warm to cold and from cold to warm. Mm. It's not, it, and I love this idea because I, I 
probably said this a hundred times on my podcast and a million times in my life, and I'll continue to, which is that biology is not an event, it's a process. Like these, these um, metabolic and thermoregulatory processes are indeed like the turning of a knob. It's a verb yeah. it's, as opposed to a noun. And, I, and so I, I think if people can internalize that idea that they're going to um, have a lot more flexibility, a lot more fun, and, and get a lot more benefit as opposed to thinking, okay, I need to get into X degrees of water for X amount of exactly. time on X number of days, yeah. you know, in a and very rigid way. I get this question way. all the time, yeah. how much and how cold? And and I mean, it's the, it's just like, well, because we also don't have studies showing exactly if you just keep five degrees in your water and you do that for a month, then what happens? We Maybe in the future we will know much more about this and I'm, sh I'm sure it's going to come and I really hope so. But I just think by logically changing that temperature up and down, up and down, and you also do that in your water, it doesn't really, it's not that important what temperature you you will have your water then. Then just keep changing it, going up and down. It could be all up to 12 degrees Celsius. You're going to activate your brown fat anyways. I mean, 12, uh, 19 degrees a cold air is enough to activate your brown fat. So maybe we don't have to go as cold as I think many people think um, and putting ice even all the time. It, you don't have to. It's not, I don't think it's necessary to, to expose yourself to that cold uh, temperature all the time, um, but vary it a bit. So keep the system off balance and yes, it's the balance. way to keep it tuned. Yeah. You mentioned a, a study that is more recent or an ongoing that's not published. Or, um, if you're willing, um, could you share maybe some of the uh, data from that uh, findings from that study um, with, of course, the the cue to everybody that these are not yet published data so that the conclusions could change, the data could change for that matter. Yeah, so we ha we haven't analyzed all the data yet. And I, I know from the study that we did publish that we we would need to look more at the data. So I don't really have any results yet that I can share because we are still in very preliminary analysis of this. So I, I wouldn't know yet what to exactly say about it. But what we looked at was both men and women. Method. So that's that's coming. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I, I'm, that answer is going to please a great number of people and, yeah. and, and, and intrigue everybody. So, well, listen, I, I want to really... Thank you for coming here today to talk about your work um, and the incredible direction that it points to. Because I think that, um, you know, no one study is definitive, but your study really, again, stands as a landmark in the uh, landscape of exploring deliberate cold exposure and heat, how it can impact and potentially impact our health. Because Frankly, there just haven't been that many um, high-resolution, uh, detailed modern studies of this. There have been studies of sauna. There have been some studies of cold. There are a lot of groups in physiology that work on um, hypothermia and very cold exposure. But um, most of the temperatures used in those studies just aren't practical. So first of all, I just want to thank you for doing the work that you've done and for the work that you continue to do. I'm um, uh, waiting with bated breath, as they say, to... Um, uh, to hear the results of this uh, study that's ongoing on both men and women. So um, we'll have to have you back to, to inform <laughs> us about that soon. And I want to thank you for um, the incredible public education efforts that you've been doing on social media um, and in, with respect to your book. Um, and we, of course, will put links to all of those things in the show note captions so people can learn from you and can continue to learn from you. We We certainly need more scientists who are both experienced with doing hardcore research, as it's called, and who also do the practices. I think that's a, a wonderful additional asset. You know, you're not just behind a lab coat or bundled up in a, in a down, uh, <laughs> in a down feather jacket as everyone else is getting into the cold. You do these things and that you are so open and generous in the way that you share uh, knowledge, which includes coming here today to, to share knowledge with me and uh, our audience. So thank you ever so much. You're very welcome. I am so pleased to be here and thank you so much for inviting me and I could explain my study and I can share some of my insights from, from doing that. So I'm very grateful for being here. Delighted and we'll have to have you back again. Thank you for joining me for today's discussion all about deliberate cold and deliberate heat exposure science and protocols with Dr. Susanna Soberg. If you'd like to learn more about Dr. Soberg's research or you would like to learn about the research of her institute, the Soberg Institute, please see the links in the show note caption. 
Also in the show note caption, you can find a link to Dr. Soberg's excellent book, Winter Swimming. If you're learning from and or enjoying this podcast, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's a terrific zero cost way to support us. In addition, please subscribe to the podcast on Spotify and Apple. And in addition, on both Spotify and Apple, you can leave us up to a five-star review. If you have questions for me or topics you'd like me to cover on the Huberman Lab podcast or guests that you'd like me to consider inviting on the Huberman Lab podcast, please put that in the comments on YouTube. I do read all the comments. In addition, please check out the sponsors mentioned at the beginning and throughout today's episode. That's the best way to support this podcast. Not so much on today's episode, but on various previous episodes of the Huberman Lab podcast, we discuss supplements. While supplements aren't necessary for everybody, many people derive tremendous benefit from them for things like enhancing sleep, focus, and hormone support. The Huberman Lab podcast is proud to have partnered with Momentous Supplements. If you'd like to hear more about the supplements discussed on the Huberman Lab podcast, please go to livemomentous, spelled O-U-S, dot com slash Huberman. Again, that's livemomentous.com slash Huberman. If you're not already following the Huberman Lab podcast on social media, We are Huberman Lab on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And on all those places, I focus on material that somewhat overlaps with content from the Huberman Lab podcast, but often is distinct from the content covered on the Huberman Lab podcast. So again, it's Huberman Lab on all social media channels. For those of you that haven't already subscribed to our so-called Neural Network newsletter, this is a completely zero-cost monthly newsletter that has summaries of podcast episodes and so-called toolkits. Toolkits are lists of about a page to two pages long that give the critical tools, for instance, for optimizing sleep or for neuroplasticity or deliberate cold exposure or deliberate heat exposure, optimizing dopamine. Again, all available to you at zero cost. You simply go to hubermanlab.com, go to the menu tab in the corner, scroll down to newsletter. You provide us your email. We do not share your email with anybody. And in addition to that, there are samples of toolkits on the hubermanlab.com website again, under newsletter, and you don't even have to sign up to access those, but I think most people do end up signing up for the newsletter because it's rich with useful information and again, completely zero cost. Thank you once again for joining me for today's discussion with Dr. Susanna Soberg. And last, but certainly not least, thank you for your interest in science. 